Okay, so welcome everybody to this evening of learning physics with conceptual and problem based approach. And uh, we welcome Professor Ajay Ghatak. He's the chairman of National Academy of Sciences India Delhi chapter. And because of his constant inspiration and motivation, me along with my co-convener and the organizing team have been capable of launching this webinar series with the sole motive of serving the students during this pandemic with complete knowledge of different subjects both at the graduation and the post graduation uh, level and it is my pleasure from uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce professor ghatak to the audience today professor ajay ghatak is a renowned indian physicist and author of many physics te textbooks he is currently professor meghnath saha fellow of nasi the national academy of sciences india his research interests are in fiber optics and quantum mechanics in recent years he has taken a keen interest in bringing the uh, genius of albert einstein to the wider public and was uh, and was uh, this is uh, to present a tedx talk inside einstein's mind in 2017 professor ghatak has written over 170 research papers and more than 20 books he has he has also written undergraduate textbook on optics and his monograph on in homogeneous optical wave guides has been translated to chinese and persian his other books include quantum mechanics theory and applications fiber optics optical electronics and lasers and a popular book on albert einstein the story of a genius in, in 1995 he was elected fellow of the optical society of america for distinguished service to optics education and for his contribution to the understanding of propagation characteristics of gradient index media fibers and integrated optical devices <laughs> professor ghatak has received his masters from delhi university and phd from cornell university usa he joined the indian institute of technology in 1965 and and uh, i can't read further dr neetu can you make it a little bit larger are chodo aap Okay, sir. So I welcome you again, and Thank I you. request you to kindly share your screen and deliver the talk. Thank you so okay. much, sir. Now, can I share my share the screen? Yes, sir. Resume your presentation. Yes, sir. Can you see? Yes, sir. Can you see this first slide? Yes, sir. We can see this now. Uh, we uh, we have to do it full full screen. Yes, sir. Can you see the first slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I start now? Yeah, please, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your kind introduction, Meeta, and. Uh, i'm going to talk to you i have given this talk a few times some of you may have heard this little bit what i'm uh -huh. going to talk today so i'm going to talk on the evolution of quantum theory if you all would switch off your mic please <laughs> okay i thought i must show you my teachers who taught me because some of you most of you are from delhi university so professor d s kothari and professor r c majumdar were professors of physics professor d s kothari actually built up the physics department at delhi university and i did my msc there and i am very proud of being associated with delhi university and professor kothari and professor majumdar taught us quantum mechanics and uh, nuclear physics and i still remember the famous sentence of professor majumdar and he would always say what is nuclear physics nuclear physics is just more of quantum mechanics and then i then this is a photograph of myself with professor d s kothari on the right and professor ajit ram verma who was the director of the national physical laboratory at iit delhi and uh, this is a photograph at iit delhi Mr. D. S. Kothari was an exceptionally simple person, simple living and high thinking, almost a Gandhian. He was a Gandhian, and I also had the privilege, great privilege, of learning, taking two courses on quantum mechanics from Hans, Professor Hans Bethe, 
Nobel laureate, who taught us two courses on quantum mechanics at Cornell University. He was a meticulous teacher. He would use the entire blackboard, remember everything, and we were always amazed to listen to his talk. The first talk, first course was on elementary quantum mechanics and the second course was on intermediate quantum mechanics. In fact, there is a book by Bethe on intermediate quantum mechanics. As you all know, this event is coordinated from their homes by Dr. Punita Varma and Dr. Pushpa Vindal are is the co-coordinator. It's a great effort. All participants must realize the tremendous efforts that they and their colleagues, many colleagues, have put in to organize such a program. And uh, I would like to express my deep sense of appreciation and also congratulations to both of them and all to all their colleagues who have helped them in organizing these beautiful course of lectures entirely for the benefit of students and researchers and college teachers and anyone who want to learn physics. Theoretical physics, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful subjects. You know, sitting with a piece of paper, you can figure out what is the temperature inside the sun. And that is, we do not know much about the inside of the earth, but we know much in great detail the inside of the sun the core of the sun, the center, the temperatures are 40 million degrees Kelvin. How do we know that? Through theoretical physics. And that is the beauty and uh, charm of theoretical physics. Because of which, I'm now almost eight, I'm 80 plus. I still enjoy reading a book on quantum mechanics or fiber optics or electromagnetic theory. Why am I telling all this? Today, there is a craze for doing an MBA and getting a job. That, that gives you a lot of money. And of course, money is very important. But the pleasure that you get out of reading, you see, a person who is, who is, doing, who is in the corporate sector gets tired out or burnt out by the time he's 50 or 60. But you see, even at the age of 80, I'm still involved. I am still enjoying my physics, whatever little I know, whatever little I can teach. So that is the thing of academics. And uh, so the young men and women who are bright, who are serious, who are conscientious, think about choosing science as a career, mathematics as a career, experiments as a career. It's a, it's a you do things which you enjoy. And you get paid for that. <laughs> so that is, uh, that is something that I'm trying to propagate. Because I was associated with IIT. And uh, most of our very bright students, right from the first year or second year, they are thinking of going for MBA. So why are you learning engineering? And it's a half-hearted attempt. So this is a very... And this is a topic on which we can talk for hours. But, uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is, if you, as a teacher or a student, try to learn a subject with dedication and concentration, you, are, you will enjoy it so much, which is unbelievable. Which is unbelievable. And I have learned many things Many simple things after my retirement, many simple conceptual things. So there is no end to learning. There is no end to learning. There is no end to learning basic physics. So I'm glad a large number of students are participating. I hope not all just for the sake of examination, but also to enjoy the subject. These are some of the most beautiful books on quantum mechanics. The first on the left is the book by Dirac, Principles of Quantum Mechanics. Professor D.S. Kothari taught us from this book. And then we have the famous Feynman Lectures, Volume 3. It's a, it's a work of art. It's a work of art. And then there is a book by, quantum, by David Bohm on quantum theory. 
And then there is a book on by Kohan Tanuji and his co-workers on quantum mechanics. This Kohan Tanuji's book is translated by two of my very good friends, Nicole and Dan Ostrowski. And here is a photograph of Dirac and Feynman, a 1962 photograph. It's a beautiful photograph. <laughs> the more I look at it, even the essays have been written just on this photograph. And I must tell you that Dirac is a Nobel laureate, Feynman in his Nobel laureate, Kohan Tanuji is a Nobel laureate, and David Bohm is almost a Nobel laureate. So will, the remarkable feature of these books are that they are error-free, conceptual, no errors. So that's why we all should read such classics. Here is J. Krishnamurti with David Bohm. You see, <laughs> when you study quantum theory in great detail, you become a philosopher. I do not know in so much detail, so I have not become a philosopher. I still enjoy doing physics and a little bit of mathematics. But when you go deep inside quantum theory, then you become a philosopher and a spiritual person. That's what happened to David Bohm. And David Bohm had tremendous respect for J. Krishnamurti. And he had, he had large number of conversations with him. And here is Kohan Tanuji receiving the Nobel Prize. And here are my two friends, Nicole and Dan Ostrowski, great physicists who translated along with Susan Henley the book on quantum mechanics. You read any one of them, uh, you will enjoy that. But <laughs> what I am going to follow is my own book on optics. This is the seventh edition, which should be out. I'm very proud of this book. I worked very, very hard to bring out the seventh edition. The publishers wanted in a color form. So I thought that, uh, so I have worked hard and I have whatever today I'm going to tell you is given in this book. And uh, of course, then I have also a, a book of which I am reasonably proud is the sixth edition of, it's a slightly advanced book on quantum mechanics with my friend and uh,
the wave is propagating in the z direction, it is given by an expression like this. It can be a cos function or a sine function, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with. So if you write this, if you take the k outside, then this becomes z minus vt, where v is defined to be equal to omega by k. This is defined to be equal to. So here v is a parameter which is defined as omega by k. And I will just now show that the quantity v represents the velocity of the wave. Because at t equal to zero, this is kz. And at t little later time, it becomes like this. So the whole displacement gets shifted by a distance v delta t in time delta t. So that the displacement of the string gets shifted to the right by a distance v delta t, where, where v is defined to be equal to omega by q. So therefore, v represents the velocity of the wave, because it moves through a distance v delta t in time delta t. So therefore, the velocity must be v. So if I can write down an equation of this form, then the velocity of the wave associated with this is given by omega by k. We will use this slightly later. And k is, of course, equal to 2 pi by lambda. It is known as the wave vector. So you have a motor wave spreading out from a vibrating point source. If you have a calm pool of water, and you have a sharp needle, you make it move up and down periodically, it will generate circular ripples, which will move out. The water molecules do not move out. It just transfers the energy from one point to the other, as it is indeed the case for the wave of the string. So here, I have shown a very nice animation, which you can see on YouTube or on the internet, you have two point sources. And that is vibrating in phase. So if you have one source, sorry, then if you have one point, it sends out circular wave. Now let us suppose there are two pins which are moving up and down in phase. That is, when one is up, one. then you produce an interference pattern. Because when there is one, then each Molecule is moving. Let us suppose it's a transverse wave. Water waves are not transverse waves. It's a little more complicated than that. But let us, for the sake of simplicity, assume that water waves are transverse waves. That is, each molecule is moving up and down perpendicular to the surface of the water. So if you have two point sources, then the molecule will be affected by the two waves and if one produces a displacement like this and the other produces a displacement opposite in phase, then it will produce a zero displacement. And if they are in phase, then, then it will be twice the displacement, twice the amplitude, and therefore four times the intensity. So if light was indeed a wave, it should produce an interference pattern. In fact, this is the interference, the actual photograph of an interference pattern produced from two point sources vibrating in phase on a ripple tank. So you have these two pointed needles which are moving up and down in phase, each producing its own disturbance. If one produces a displacement y1, which is equal to a cos omega t, and the other produces a displacement minus a cos omega t, then the resultant will be zero. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. This is what you are taught at the school level. So Thomas Young, it was only in 1801, beginning of the 19th century, he carried out a beautiful experiment. He allowed sunlight, sunlight to pass through a filter, it probably a red filter or something like that. So the light that was entered was red in color, and he allowed to pass through two pinholes. See, many people say Young's double slit experiment. Now, Young's original experiment was a double hole experiment. 
And with double hole, you get straight line interference fringes, almost straight line. Actually, they are, as you must be knowing, hyperbolic in nature. But they are not hyper. If, if you take the small portion of that, or if the distance between the two holes are very small, then they are almost straight line fringes, as you must have seen in your Fresnel's by prism experiment, which most of you must have done. So, so light coming from this hole and light coming from this hole interfere. And that interference can happen only if light is a wave. So one, this is a quotation from Max Born. Max Born says, light plus light can produce darkness. And I'm sure all of you are familiar. You can do an elementary mathematics and you can find the wavelength was equal to fringe width multiplied by the distance between the two, two holes. And capital D is the distance between this plane and this plane. So you could calculate the wavelength from his measurements. Thomas Young found that the wavelength was about half of a micron. And immediately after Thomas Young, there were many experiments which, which were done showing the interference pattern. Thomas Young explained also the Newton's rings experiment, which was actually first observed by, you see, Newton's rings, I'm sure all of you have done that experiment, was first observed by uh, Boyd or someone, Boyle. He had observed it. Newton gave a wrong explanation based on particle model of light. Newton gave a wrong explanation. And, uh, and then the correct explanation was given by Thomas Young. But so much was hero worshipping at that time that it is now referred to as Newton's rings, whereas Newton did not do much in the formation or in the discovery of the Newton's rings. Whatever it is, it, that is a very beautiful experiment demonstrating the wave nature of light. So here is a very beautiful experiment that is discussed in the Feynman lectures. And I would like you to also listen to the Feynman lectures on YouTube and uh, in which he says that if I have a gun which emits two, emits large number of particles, corpuscles, like Newton's corpuscles, then the corpuscles will either go through hole number, and there are two holes here, two holes here, so hole number one or hole number two. If hole number one is open, then you get an intensity distribution like this, and if hole number two is open, then you get an intensity distribution like this. If both holes are open, then the, elect then the, then the tiny particles will pass through either hole number one or hole number two, and you get P12 is equal to P1 plus P2. So there is no interference. The interference phenomenon is due to the wave nature of light. Actually, People say that uh, Thomas Young was the last man who knew everything. And there is a book by Andrew Robertson, which has the title that the last man who knew everything. In, in physics lately, what people say the last man who knew almost the entire physics was Richard Feynman and Landau. Landau is a Russian physicist, was a Russian physicist, both dead now. So, they are the two people who knew everything of physics. So, light was soon, there were experiments, as you know, by Fresnel, Fronhofer, and many other people. And the diffraction of light was observed. They were difficult to observe because light, as you know, visible wavelength is about half of a micron. But, it, but the diffraction pattern was uh, calculated using a wave theory, and it agreed with the experiment. So very soon, by 1815 or so, it was absolutely well established that light was indeed a wave. But how could it propagate through vacuum? What was the displacement associated with the wave? What is the displacement? Kya, kya move kar raha hai? And that worried 
and as you all know, the theory of ether was developed. An all-pervading ether, ether that is present in vacuum. What are those properties, properties of ether? So, Mabier, Stokes, Halmons worked on the theory of ether. But today we know that the ether does not exist. So I will not go into it. Around the same period of time, beginning of 19th century, the laws of electricity and magnetism were getting discovered. Michael Faraday, the famous physicist, he was said to be man of science and man of God. Michael Faraday, great man, great man. And he discovered a Faraday's law, if you have a magnet near a coil, you make it move up and down and it will generate a current. So a changing magnetic field induces an electromagnetic force. He wrote down that law and uh, Maxwell put that. That was the greatness of Maxwell. He put down the Faraday's law in the form of a vector equation. So it's an experimental law. Maxwell's equations are based on experimental findings. So he, he fact, Maxwell, he wrote down in the law in the form of an integral and uh, Maxwell wrote it in the form of an equation. Around the same time, Ampere had discovered worst, uh, the Ampere's law that if you have a if you have a conductor carrying current, then it produces a magnetic field. Actually, it was discovered by Oersted. But Ampere put it in a form of a law. He wrote down the law. And once again, it was Maxwell who put it in the form of a vector equation. That curl of H is equal to J, where J is the current density. So a current produces a magnetic field. Then Maxwell made a, a, one of the most, one of the greatest contributions in physics. He said that not only a current produces a magnetic field, but a changing electric field also produces a magnetic field. And he introduced the term which is now known as the displacement current. The justification came from the fact that Divergence of curl of H, those of you who are familiar, is always zero. Divergence of the curl of a vector is always zero. So divergence of J is zero. But you know the equation of continuity, the divergence of J plus delta rho by delta T is zero. So for this law to be consistent with the equation of continuity, he introduced a, another term. So this is the conduction current. J is the conduction current. And this is known as the displacement current. And he introduced that term. Introducing this term revolutionized physics. That is, between the plates of the condenser, there is a changing, while it is getting charged, there is a changing electric field. And that will produce a magnetic field. And that was Maxwell's great contribution. So let me consider Faraday's law. Just write down the Faraday's law in free space, in vacuum. So it is minus delta B by delta T, so mu zero. B is equal to mu zero H, and mu zero is equal to the magnetic permeability in free space, which has a value of 4 pi into 10 to the power of 7, minus 7 in NKS units. Now let me substitute a wave-like. This is a wave-like equation because you have sine Kz minus omega T. It's an x-polarized wave because the electric field is in the x-direction. So you have Ex is equal to E0 sine Kz of minus omega t, Ey is 0, Ez is 0. Let me, let me substitute this in this equation. So curl of E, as you all know, is x cap, y cap, z cap, delta by delta x, delta by delta y, delta by delta z, Ex, Ey, Ez. But there is no y and x and y dependence here. So there is no y and 
uh, x and y dependence on any of the components of E. So I can put that zero, put that zero, delta by delta z, and EY and EZ are zero. So I have assumed an electric field given by this equation, which represents a wave, which represents a wave. So I substitute it here, and I obtain, if I work this out, then Y cap, delta EX by delta Z, and since delta EX by delta Z will be K times cos, that is it. So this is equal to curl of E is equal to minus mu zero delta H by delta T. And now I integrate this. So if I integrate this, I will get sign with an omega in the denominator, and I will get something like this. H of Zt is equal to Y cap, K by omega mu zero. There will be a minus sign because there is a minus sign here while integrating to this. So if E is given by this, then H is in the, if E is in the X direction, then the magnetic field is in the Y direction. And that is the solution of Faraday's law, Faraday's equation. So what I have proved is, what I have proved is the following, that an equation of this type, a wave-like solution, wave-like electric field of this type is a solution of Faraday's law. Okay. Now, so therefore, using the Faraday's law, I have just the Faraday's law. I've assumed this form of electric field. Then the corresponding magnetic field, I calculate the curl of E, which I did, and then integrate with respect to time, and I will get this. So this is an electromagnetic wave. Let me do one more thing. Then I take the Ampere's law as modified by Maxwell. And this is my delta D by delta T term. And in free space, D is equal to epsilon zero times E. So this is my displacement current, as I had mentioned before. And now, these are the two solutions that I have obtained from Faraday's law. I substitute it here. I leave this as an exercise. You take the curl, you calculate the curl of H just in a way similar to how I have calculated how I had calculated curl of E, and show that this all these satisfy this equation. But when you substitute this, you will get the value of omega by k. And you will get omega by k is equal to 1 by mu 0 epsilon 0. So therefore, Maxwell's equations admit solutions representing electromagnetic waves. So by solving, that is the beauty of theoretical physics. By solving Maxwell's equations, Maxwell could produce, could, could, could predict the existence of electromagnetic waves. Because his equa equations admitted wave-like solutions. I hope this point is clear. Associated with the electromagnetic wave, there is an electric field and a magnetic field. One cannot exist without the other. So if E0 is 0, then H is also 0. And if H is 0, then E is also 0. So both are in phase, but at right angles to each other. So that came out of the equations. That is the beauty of theoretical physics. And he could then predict that the, he substituted the values of mu naught and epsilon naught, and he found a value actually 3.1 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. This was in 1860, around that, 1860. And then he said, at that time, Fizeau, had measured the velocity of light in air, and that value was also close to 3.1 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. And Maxwell said, 
that these two numbers cannot be accidentally equal. And so therefore, light must be an electromagnetic wave. It is one of the greatest synthesis in the development of science. You have two areas. One is optics and the other is electricity and magnetism. Even today, we teach subjects separately. Optics first, and then electricity and magnetism, or vice versa. But they are part of the same electromagnetic theory. They are unified. The Maxwell unified the laws of physics. And therefore, he is considered as one of the greatest physicists of all times. Some people call him better than Einstein, but that is, I think, pushing it too much. So, you substitute it there and you get this value. This is the inverse of the in, uh, impedance of the free space though, for those who are familiar. So, this is these are my electromagnetic waves. A changing electric field produces a changing magnetic field and a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. That is how the fields get propagated through empty space. I always mention in my lectures that the concept of the field which we take for granted was introduced by Michael Faraday. Today we take that for granted. But you see, before Faraday, one knew that the two charges repel or attract one another. And uh, what Faraday said, that even if the other charge is not there, if there is one charge, it produces an electric field. And that field exists everywhere. So when this electromagnetic wave propagates through vacuum, the fields propagate. Energy propagates. There is energy associated with it. Because electromagnetic waves carry energy. So the energy is propagated when, the, when you receive the sunlight. Energy is propagating through free space in the form of light, in the form of electromagnetic waves. So around 1864, Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves <coughs> and said light itself is an electromagnetic wave. What time is it? Okay. Light itself is an electromagnetic wave. And this is an expolarized wave. And one can say, God said, let there be electricity and magnetism. This is what Feynman has written in his book. Let there will be Maxwell's equations and there will be light. Okay. Maxwell's equations, when discovery took place around 1864, then Heinrich Hertz generated electromagnetic waves through an LCR circuit and allowed the beam to get reflected by an aluminum screen and form standing waves as you obtain on a sonometer wire. He determined the wavelength and the, he calculated the frequency and calculated the velocity and he found that the velocity of these electromagnetic waves that are generated are the same as that of the visible light. So, Heinrich Hertz's 1887 experiments confirmed the, the Maxwell's electromagnetic wave theory. I will tell you a simple experiment. Here is a light beam entering a glass and a glass prism. And let us suppose the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. And then the light beam gets total internal light beam undergoes total internal reflection. If you put another prism with a small air gap, then a bit of light gets tunnels through. This is known as optical tunneling. It's a, it, there's no quantum mechanics here. This is a simple consequence of if you solve Maxwell's equations for this structure, you will get a small, small tunneling. And uh, what I wanted to tell you about a great Indian scientist, actually, I should not call him a physicist, scientist. He worked on many, many areas. This was the prism that he used in 1894. 1894, 
Jagadish Chandra Bose was the first to demonstrate optical tunneling using millimeter waves. So that the electromagnetic waves uh, uh, undergo frustrated total internal reflection. This is known as the frustrated FTIR, frustrated total internal reflection. And he demonstrated that for the first time. And, uh, and many people feel that he should have got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of, uh, of millimeter waves, which could be used for communication. So this is my entire electromagnetic spectrum, from gamma rays to X-rays to ultraviolet, as you all know, infrared, microwave, radio waves. All of them are electromagnetic waves. They have different frequencies, but all wavelengths travel in free space with an identical velocity of 299792458 meters per second. X-rays, as you know, have a very high frequency, 10 to the power of 18 hertz. This is 10 to the gamma rays have even higher frequencies. And radio waves are in the megahertz region, the one that you receive on your on your cell phone. And the visible region from 0.4 micron to 0.7 micron wavelength occupy a tiny region in the electromagnetic spectrum. So Max Planck had said that Maxwell's theory remains for all time one of the greatest triumphs of human intellectual endeavor. In 1894, Maxwell's theory was applied to solids, liquids, and everything. The uh, calculation of refractive index and reflection coefficient, transmission coefficient, some of you may have already worked that. So people thought that that is the end of physics. There is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurements. And then came Einstein. And Einstein was in the Swiss patent office working in total isolation when in 1905 he wrote five outstanding papers which changed the face of physics. Relativity, special theory of relativity was one of them. E is equal to mc square was one of them and, and three other ways. Brownian motion was another. In the second paper in his year of miracles, Einstein wrote radiation energy. Radiation energy is light consists of indivisible quanta of energy, packets of energy. And the packet of energy was each new. And in a later paper, not in 1905, around 1907 or 1908, he said that these also carry momentum. This paper is the first paper on wave-particle duality. Because light was known to be a wave. Now he put forward that, that he said, that light also can be thought of as carrying indivisible, which cannot be broken apart, packets of energy. And what is that amount of energy? If light has frequency nu, then the energy is h nu. These packets of energy, quanta of energy, later came to be known as photons. So he explained photoelectric effect by that. And this is, the, this is the equation that we derived that the maximum T max is the maximum kinetic energy of the photon, uh, sorry, of the electron. So here I have a surface like sodium and here is a ultraviolet light falling and the ultraviolet light gives the energy to the sodium or cesium or potassium plate and the electrons come out. And the maximum kinetic energy of the electron is equal to H nu, which is the energy of the photon, minus a constant. This constant depends on the metal itself. It is different for sodium, it is different for potassium. In 1914, this is what Einstein predicted, and Einstein got the Nobel Prize for this equation. And then about nine years later, Robert Millikan 
carried out beautiful set of experiments and verified this equation. He measured the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons and he found a, a absolute straight line as a function of frequency. And he calculated the value of B for each metal. So what Millikan did, he verified the Einstein equation. Albert Einstein received the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics. This is a photo of the medal that Einstein had received, in which it is written Einstein uh, Physics, I think. I can't read this. And then Robert Millikan received the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physics. You must remember that his five papers were in 1905, and it took 16 years and a lot of politics. No one would give Einstein the Nobel Prize because he was a, probably a Jew. And that is the politics that goes on in the... There is a very beautiful book by Friedman, The Politics of Nobel Prize, Politics of Excellence. And there is too much of politics that goes on. And uh, people thought that uh, that was one of the greatest mistakes that would happen if Einstein did not receive the Nobel Prize. Life is not fair. And one of the greatest mistakes of the Nobel Prize Committee is, I would like you to think for a minute, is not awarding the Nobel Prize to Mahatma Gandhi. That Nobel Peace Prize, he was nominated six times, but he never received the Nobel Prize. And that is considered as the greatest mistake of the, of the Nobel Committee. So Robert Millikan received the Nobel Prize. 23 Nobel Prize in Physics for, for, for verifying the Einstein equation with a tremendous degree of accuracy. Then came a Compton's paper. This is after. But you see, you must know that Einstein did not get the Nobel Prize for the concept of the photon. He, he got the Nobel Prize at that time, relativity was also established. His general theory of relativity was there. That he did not get the Nobel Prize. That is one of the greatest uh, questions that have been raised. He got the Nobel Prize for the equation describing the photoelectric effect, which has been verified experimentally. So no one really believed at that time in the concept of the photon. Because Maxwell's theory was so well established that people did people thought that they will find an explanation for the photoelectric effect and other things, and then <coughs> they will. Uh, uh, but so the concept of the photon was still not believed even by Max Planck, even by Max Planck. And then, in 1923, two years after Einstein got the Nobel Prize. Arthur Compton carried out very beautiful experiments in which he allowed gamma ray photons, very high energy photons, to hit an electron and the scattered photon had a reduced energy and there was a recoil electron. He then calculated, this was a collision process, calculated the, did the kinematics, laws of conservation, applied the laws of conservation of momentum and energy. And he calculated the, the, the frequency of the scattered radiation. So this is the wavelength, which is uh, related to the frequency. And he calculated that, and this is the curve that he got as a function of theta. Theta is the angle of scattering. So you have a high energy photon coming in, and, uh, and the scattered photon has a slightly lower energy. It's like a two elastic ball colliding as you must have done in your mechanics course. And he derived this formula. And uh, this is the in angstroms. And these are the experimental points. It was only after 1923 that people started believing in Einstein's light quantum in Einstein's photon, okay? Arthur Compton received the 1927 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of Compton's catalytic. 
Then, as you all know, J.J. Thompson in 1897 had discovered the electron. We now know the mass of the electron to 10 decimal places. The charge of the electron to 10 decimal places. It can be deflected by an electric field or the magnetic field. So, for all practical purposes, on the back of my mind, electron is, is a particle, is a tiny particle. Then, George Thompson received the 1906 Nobel Prize in Physics for his experiments with electrons. Then in De Broglie, in 1924, he said that this is the expression for the momentum of the photon, which Einstein had derived in 1909, 1908, I think. H nu by C, which is H by lambda. And he predicted, you must understand, that Einstein, de Broglie, in his doctoral thesis, predicted the wave nature of electrons. And once again, that is again the beauty of theoretical physics. The experiments were not carried out at that time. He said that electrons must also, he predicted that electrons must also demonstrate wave-like properties whose wavelength will be given by H by P, as I'm sure all of you know. How did he justify it? At that time, Niels Bohr had given his model of the hydrogen atom, the model of the hydrogen atom, and that he said that each level, each orbit of the hydrogen atom, electrons are rotating in discrete orbits, and each discrete orbit corresponds to the angular momentum being an integral multiple of h by 2 pi. This he wrote down around 1913 or 14. This is the famous Bohr model of the atom, which we teach now in our high school, uh, class 11 or class 12. So, so, De Broly said, MVR is equal to NH by 2 pi, means 2 pi R is equal to NH by MV, and this is equal to NH by P. And so, therefore, he said that, therefore, each Bohr orbit has an integral number of wavelengths. That is how you form a stationary state kind of a thing. So, each discrete Bohr orbit is such that it has an integral number of wavelengths as the circumference. So this he predicted in 1924. Niels Bohr had come to Delhi University in 1960 and gave a beautiful lecture. I still remember. And it's about 60 years back. And I am, I am this young man standing here. I was once upon a time a young man. <laughs> and this is Professor R. P. Mitra, Professor of Chemistry, Professor F. C. Ola, Professor of Critical Physics. And this is myself, and this is Professor Chandra. Professor D. S. Kothari must be here. I cannot figure that out. But this is an old black and white photograph which someone took very nicely, in which I also appear. So Niels Bohr received the 1922 Nobel Prize in Physics. And de Broglie received the 1929 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of wave nature of electrons. But it was only two years or three years after the discovery, after the prediction of de Broglie, that the wave nature of electron was experimentally established by Davison and German in the US, in New York, and, and by G.P. Thompson who is the son of J.J. Thompson. And so they carried out beautiful experiments. These are not their experimental results, but I, I want to show you that this is the diffraction pattern produced by aluminum foil. When you bombard with electrons, this is with the electrons, and the, 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 the circles appear at the same place. And if you, produce, if, if you bombard the foil by X-rays. So therefore, X-rays, which are electromagnetic waves, and electrons, which are electrons, they are the same. If one is a wave, then the other is a wave. If one is particle, then the other is a particle. So people say, J.J. Thompson discovered the particle nature of electron, 
and G his son G. P. Thompson discovered the wave nature of electrons. Father and son, both. So this experiment was carried out by Davison and Germer, and unfortunately Germer did not get the Nobel Prize. But Davison and Thompson shared the 1937 Nobel Prize in Physics for their experimental discovery of the diffraction of electrons by crystal. You see, this thing, I wanted to tell the younger generation, these things happen. You do not get the credit that you deserve. Many people that feel that Germer should have received the Nobel Prize. Many people feel that, uh, that uh, Raman and Krishnan, Krishnan should have also shared the Nobel Prize. It was Krishnan who discovered Raman effect on 28th of February, 1928. Krishnan was his PhD student, but in the very first paper, although the observations were made by Krishnan, and this Raman acknowledged in his paper, but Krishnan was not the author, and the person who was nominated was Raman, and Raman got the Nobel Prize. In fact, it is said in one of the latest books that Krishnan, uh, that in the committee someone said that Krishnan should also get the Nobel Prize, should also share the Nobel Prize. And the answer was that Krishnan was not nominated for the Nobel Prize. These are injustices that happen uh, everywhere in the world, not only in India, but uh, uh, everywhere in the world. I thought I will share that with you. So the main thing is that there is the electron or the proton or the neutron or alpha particle, a wave or a particle. That's a, some books write, it is a wave and a particle. Some books write that it is sometimes a wave, sometimes a particle. They are all wrong, all incorrect answer. Because the correct answer, listen to this carefully, was given by a fine man. And he says they are neither waves nor particles. That's a very profound statement. Some people say it, it, it has wave aspect and particle. No, 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 that is not possible. It cannot be simultaneously a wave and a particle. The answer is they are neither waves nor particles. Of course, then I have not answered the question that what is the electron? So the question is, then, then Feynman say it is described by the wave function psi. And what is this psi? Listen to this carefully. Psi is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Where did I get that equation from? And the answer is nowhere. Where did we get that equation from? Nowhere. It is not possible to derive the Schrodinger equation from anything you know. And that's what Feynman writes. And Feynman, in his three volumes, has not given a single erroneous statement. You all must read Feynman lectures. It's a beautiful book, three set of three volumes. It is full of concepts and no errors. He was the last complete physicist. And uh, it came out of the mind of Schrodinger. That's what Feynman said. So I always emphasize on this point that Schrodinger equation cannot be derived. From classical mechanics, you cannot derive Schrodinger equation. You have a heuristic set of arguments which lead to the Schrodinger equation, and I will give you one. So let me go ahead. So people love the Schrodinger equation so much that they have painted the equation on them. Many have tattooed. If you go uh, to you internet and say that I want images of the Schrodinger equation, you will see young men and women have tattooed them on every part of their body. <laughs> so it is So it is a beautiful equation. The two equations that are very famous are the Schrodinger equation and the equation E is equal to mc squared. So let me take a plain wave. I am giving you a heuristic derivation. There is no rigor in this. So this is a plain wave. I showed you that 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 the, a, a, a wave is described by sine of chaos kx minus omega t or cos of kx minus omega t. Then I said that often I represent it by a exponential term. And then I somehow inject the wave particle duality. Oh my god, the battery is low. Just one second, just one second.
अरे पुनीता जी कितना टाइम हो गया ओके सो वी आर दी डिब्रॉय रिलेशन एक्चुअली इट इज प्रोनाउंस डिब्रॉय डिब्रॉय इट्स ए फ्रेंच नेम डिब्रॉय ही वॉज ए प्रिंस पी इज इक्वल टू एच बाई लैमडा I divide and multiply by two pi. I get h cross k. So I get k is equal to p by h cross, where h cross is equal to h by two pi. We also have the Einstein relation, which is e is equal to h nu h cross omega. So omega is equal to. So I substitute for k this and this. So somehow I have put in the wave a particle nature. So I write down this. So, a, a wave describing an electron can be written like this. So now I differentiate with respect to time. So for a free particle, e is equal to p square by two m. Listen to this carefully. So e is equal to p square by two m. So I have this equation for the wave function. I differentiate this with respect to time, and I get. Minus i h cross p square by two m minus i by i by h cross and i h cross that is minus i times plus i is one, and then h cross h cross cancel out and you get. I differentiate with respect to x twice, so I get i by h cross p times i by h cross p, which is minus p square by h cross square, multiplied by minus h cross square by two m h cross square cancel out p square by two m. So the right hand sides are equal. So the left hand sides have to be equal. So this is my one-dimensional time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a free particle. Then the philosophy is this: I take this as my bible. Don't ask me how I have got this. I work out its solution and compare with experiments. And there, and there lies the success of quantum mechanics. So don't ask me how I have each book. If you read Dirac's book, if you read Feynman's book, if you read Cohen Tanuji's book, and if you read David Bohm's book, they all have different ways of getting at the Schrodinger equation. So you can somehow get at the Schrodinger equation. Then forget about how you have done that, and solve it. And this Schrodinger did in his 1926 paper. He solved the entire quantum mechanics. He was a great mathematician, and he wrote that paper in the, when he was at about 40 years old, 39 years old. And he was he was once he wrote that equation, he could write the solution and obtain the hydrogen atoms problem in no time. So he wrote three great papers in 1926, for which he was awarded the half of the Nobel Prize. So, if the particle is in a potential field V of x, then E is equal to p square by 2m plus V of x. So then I h cross what I have done. So this becomes this, and you get the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a particle. If instead of a one-dimensional wave, I had started with a three-dimensional wave, what is a three-dimensional wave? It is k dot r minus. This equation represents a three-dimensional wave, where k is the direction of propagation of the wave. If k is in the x direction, then I will get this equation. If k is in the y direction, then we will get k y y or k z z. Or if all of them are there, then you have this. So now you differentiate with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z twice, and then you will get this three-dimensional. I would leave that as an exercise. I will get the three-dimensional time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a sorry. This is this is a wrong thing. Not for a free particle. For a particle in the potential energy function V of R. Let me tell you something. A major portion of non-relativistic quantum mechanics is just the solution of the Schrodinger equation for different potential. 
90 percent, the spin of the electron is put from the top. That an electron behaves like a tiny magnet. It has a magnetic moment. So that is a beautiful thing. Probably someday I will do with you. The measurement of the magnetic moment and therefore the stern gerlach experiment. But you put the magnetic moment of the electron and magnetic moment of the proton and that is the entire quantum mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, sorry. Scattering theory is just the solution of the Schrodinger equation, even the scattering problem. And that this, uh, the, the equation cannot be solved exactly, you, you develop approximate methods, like the WKB method, like the perturbation method, like the variational method. So all these the entire, my book on non-relativistic quantum mechanics, a major portion, 80% of the book, is just trying to work out the solution of this equation. The entire field of particle electricity and magnetism, electrodynamics that we read in our BSc honors or MSc, are just the solutions of Maxwell's equations, which cannot be derived, which are experimental laws. So similarly, you write down now the Schrodinger equation and take that as a Bible and don't worry about it. <clears throat> what should I do? Uh, so in his 1926 paper, Schrodinger solved the equation this for the hydrogen-like item problem and derived the the, the the hydrogen atom spectrum, and that was the first great success of, uh, he said that the well-behaved solution of this equation existed only if the energy of the system is given by these discrete values. So for negative values of E, you obtain the bound states. For positive values of E, you obtain the scattering of electrons by protons. So everything is contained in the solution of the Schrodinger equation. And this is really beautiful. This is really beautiful. So the emission and the absorption spectrum of the hydrogen were explained by Schrodinger in his 1926 paper. Uh, Pushpaji and Punita ji, what should I do? Should I take up questions or should I continue? Sir, if you wish, you can continue for some more time and then maybe you can take questions. The next lecture starts on um, kya time? 6.30, sir. 6.30. Uh, six the second. 6.16. 6.16. Okay, let's go. 5 minutes or... Questions to find out what questions are. Let's see. Where are they? Yes, sir. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Chat box, sir. Chat box. Chat box, sir. There is no question. Yes, sir. There is no question. Yes, sir. There is no question. Should I read them out? No, no. Ah, chat box. Where is it? The right side, right side. Ah, right, right side. Me, it is written that visible screen. There are no questions. Ah, just, just. Ah, sir, continue. 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 Ah, Mukesh, switch off the camera. Thanks, man. Ah, no, no. There is no special question. Everyone asking to switch off the camera, etc. So don't worry. So let me talk for 10 more minutes and then I will. Uh, is that yes, all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so in 6 18, I will talk for 8 more minutes. Because next lecture, Can you see my slide now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So if you now, you, know, you forget about everything. You forget about everything. You say that a free particle confined to move along the x-axis 
is described by this equation. Is described by this equation. Don't ask me how I have got it. The electron or the proton is described by the wave function psi. And let me work out the solution of this equation. So, <clears throat> if you use the separation of variables, you will get an equation like this. Actually, we had started out with this equation to derive this equation. So, this must be the solution. So, P goes from plus infinity, from uh, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. P is just a number here. So, since all values of P are possible, so the most general solution of the Schrodinger equation is given by this. This forms what is known as a wave packet. Now understand this. And this I will do tomorrow in great detail. That Max Born interpreted this, used the Schrodinger equation to discuss, describe mod psi square dx is the probability of finding the electron between x and x plus dx. It's a distribution. You must remember that psi mod square is not the probability. Mod psi square dx, it's, it is said to be a psi mod psi square is a probability distribution function. So that mod psi square dx is the probability of finding the electron or the proton between x and x plus dx. And this is a superposition of plane waves corresponding to different momentum. And therefore, AP squared BP, if mod psi squared dx is normalized, then AP squared DP is also normalized. Is the probability of finding the x component of the momentum between P and P plus DP. Max Born received the 1954 Nobel Prize in Physics for the physical interpretation of the wave function. So let us suppose I have a wave packet which is described by this equation. This is known as the Gaussian wave packet. Then I represent a single electron or a single proton by this wave packet. Then the probability distribution, probability that the x, comp x component of the position lies between x and x plus dx is equal to mod psi x zero squared dx is equal to so much. So psi of xt, this is the general solution. If I make t equal to zero, then psi of x comma zero is so much. If I take the inverse Fourier transform, this I will discuss tomorrow in detail. Then if I, then it is given by this. So if I know psi of x comma zero, then I can find out A of P by carrying out this integral. Once I know A of P, I can substitute it back and calculate the time evolution of the wave packet. So, if my psi of x comma zero is the Gaussian wave packet, then A of P is given by this. And A of P is mod square dp, if you calculate, I would like all of you to calculate this, you will find that that is another Gaussian. So if the particle is localized within a distance of the order of sigma naught, then its momentum is this uncertainty in momentum is of the order of h cross by sigma naught. Because this is x square by sigma naught square. So this is p minus p naught square divided by delta p whole square, where delta p is equal to h cross by sigma naught. So if, if the particle is localized within a distance of sigma naught, then its momentum spread is localized within a distance of h cross by sigma naught. 
So therefore, the uncertainty principle is contained in the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Everything is contained. All solutions of the Schrodinger equation are consistent with the uncertainty principle. Okay, what I would do is, I would uh, stop here right now and uh, see one or two questions if they are there. And uh, uh, Sir, should I read them out for you? Sir, should I read them out for you? Yes, tell me, where is it? Yes, sir, there are three or four relevant questions. Okay, ma'am. First, let me read out some of the questions. There is one, uh, Arya Gauri. If Schrodinger's equation was not derived, what led to the formation of the equation? <laughs> you see, it is something like this. I did give you a heuristic derivation of the Schrodinger equation. If you read Schrodinger's original paper, he gave a, 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 a iconal type of an equation he started and he and he arrived somehow. The derivation is not rigorous. The derivation is not rigorous because you cannot derive an equation in quantum mechanics from classical laws of physics. And therefore, Schrodinger equation cannot be derived. Another question is, could you say what is tunneling of millimeter light? You said how it could be done. Was it done with 100% efficiency? No. The tunneling experiment that I showed only said it can happen 50% of the light or 40% of the light or 10%. If the air gap is large, then only 10% of the light will pass through. So, but this is this is something like the wave optics gives this result. But if you consider this as a photon, then the tunneling is a quantum mechanical concept. How do I put it? How do I put it? You see, this follows from, I mean, tunneling, optical tunneling in frustrated total internal reflection is just a solution of the Schrodinger equation, as of the of the Maxwell's equations. But if you did the tunneling experiment for electrons or even photons, if you take them a purpose, so so the question is, no, let me take a simple thing. Let me take a simple thing. I have a beam splitter. I have individual photons coming in. Will it go here or will it go here? As soon as you have a particle nature of light, there's a 50% probability of coming here, 50% of probability coming there. In fact, if you do not make a measurement, it is both in the reflected beam and in the transmitted beam. So it is here as well as there. So electron can be at two places at the same time. Tomorrow, when I do the double hole experiment or the double slit experiment, I will tell you that the electron passes through both the slits. Does it split? No, it does not split. It is, it is, it is described by a wave function which is present in front of one hole and the other hole. It interferes with itself to produce a probability distribution which is the same as the intensity distribution given by wave theory. Sir, in electro Akshita Goel, in electromagnetic waves, the electric and magnetic field propagate at all times perpendicular to each other. If one creates the other, why don't the fields exist alternately in time? Like electric field creates the magnetic field. Electric field, a changing electric field produces a changing magnetic field physically. But the one cannot exist without the other. One cannot exist without the other. Sir, do we only study about wave nature of particle in quantum mechanics or do we also study particle nature of waves? They're the same. They are neither waves nor particles. 
Of course, you see, when you detect an electron, you always detect one electron or no electron. If you detect light, then it is either one photon or no photon. So the detection process is always quantized. So here is the particle nature of radiation. And when you see the interference pattern, tomorrow I will do that in great detail. I will I'll do that in great detail about the, the wave and the particle nature being simultaneously how you can understand. And the main thing that you must understand is it is neither particle nor wave. I have a question. Nikita Mehta, please explain the non-existence of possibilities of existence of magnetic... Oh, that I do not know. Magnetic monopoles. I know what I know. I also know what I do not know. Magnetic monopoles, I do not know. Is based on experimental laws. Is possible the physics changes if you observe it in another world. What is another world? I don't know of existence of another world. I know of only this world. And... Uh, No, Schrodinger's equation, yeah, you see, he used, uh, Schrodinger himself used a hand-waving argument. You cannot derive from any classical Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Uh, and, uh, shalom, let us end there, okay? And uh, see you then, hopefully tomorrow we will see. Okay, I have to go somewhere, Punita. Uh, okay, ah. All right. Okay. Ah. <laughs> oh my god uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me. Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. I hope the students have got something out of it. But uh, let us hope that so. Chalo? Okay? Okay. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, am I audible?
थैंक्स डॉक्टर पुनीत फॉर सच ए वंडरफुल इंट्रोडक्शन and i also thank the organizers for extending me the invitation to give a presentation at this platform and i hope uh, i will be up to their expectations and the students who are attending this seminar will gain some knowledge on uh, radiation detectors and uh, uh, i will uh, start my uh, presentation uh are the slides visible now yes sir okay yes sir it is visible so i will go in the presentation mode so good evening everybody so of course the topic is uh, detectors but i will be focusing on radiation detectors detectors has a very broad meaning so i will be focusing on radiation detectors essentially used for detection detecting your uh, charged particle detectors like heavy ions or even light ions and also neutral particles like photons and neutrons so as dr verma has told i come from inter university accelerator center and in the background of the first slide you can see the uh, our institute and this tower houses a wendy graph generator or tandem wendy graph generator called pelotron why pelotron because in a normal wendy graph generator you use a conveyor belt for uh, transporting the charge here we essentially use metal pellets which have a more charge holding capacity and this is the laboratory complex so yes uh i think my camera is on i believe yes ma'am sir yeah yes camera is on okay so inter university accelerator center is a inter university consortium for accelerator based studies set up by university grants commission in 1984 and this accelerator complex as such came up in late 80s and early 90s and since then it has been involved in the research area of nuclear atomic and material science and uh, we have a 15 million volt tandem accelerator and uh, this has been uh, in the past uh, 10 years has been aug augmented by a superconducting linac booster so that we can apply ions ranging from proton to gold from 1 mev per nucleon to 8 mev per nucleon depending upon the type of ion and then we have another augmentation pro program going on to add a high current injector which will provide high intensity heavy ion beams so this is the layout this is the pelotron and uh, uh, you have a ion source uh, at the top of the tower that i had showed you in the first slide so it introduces uh, negative ions and this terminal at the center is at positive potential and this negative ions are accelerated towards this uh, positive potential and where there is a carbon stripper which will remove uh, 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 most of the electrons from the ion and then you have a positive ion and a positive potential which will further repel these ions to higher energies and then we have some facilities in the first beam hall and for high energy experiments we have this superconducting linac booster so this is the inside of the pelotron uh, tank and this is our ion source now why do we need this uh, uh, accelerator and uh, followed by detector because we want to probe the origin of universe so essentially we simulate the origin of universe by performing nuclear reactions inside a laboratory complex so what we need is a physics problem okay based on the physics problem we need an accelerator 
one can of course do a chemical reaction also if you want to probe uh, some uh, molecule but since we are talking uh, trying to probe nucleus so we go for nuclear reactions which require higher energies and higher energy means you require a particle accelerator and once you have a physics problem you have a particle accelerator then to probe or to investigate these reaction you need a radiation detector detection system so research carried out at iuac using this ion beams and radiation detectors are essentially nuclear physics material science atomic physics molecular physics radiation biology and in the recent times we have also started a program on accelerator mass spectroscopy now what is a detector it is nothing but essentially a sensor similar to our natural human sensors like eyes are light sensor ears are your sound sensor nose is your odor sensor tongue is your flavor sensor and skin gives you the sensation of a touch or a contact now each of these sensors has its own uniqueness as well as limitations for example eyes they have a limited visible range by visible range i mean the wavelength or frequency so typical visible range lies between your 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer distance if you are flying say at at a height of 10 to 12 kilometers in an aircraft then you can view an uh, radius of uh, about 50 kilometers but your resolution will be very limited in contrast eagles they have eyes which have a much better resolution at long distance again sorry ears audible frequency range is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz audible volume is uh, minus 20 db to 60 db whereas animals they can sense lower frequencies or lower volumes as well similarly nose it can smell odor but again there are limitations but then you have animals like dogs which have a better smelling sensation and they can smell narcotics explosives and so on which humans cannot so is your skin and so is your tongue similarly detectors also have their radiation detectors also have their some limitations and some uniqueness what is a modern radiation detector it is a, essentially a device capable of producing a usable signal for a given type of radiation and energy as i told you radiation detector is nothing but eyes of an experimentalist you are performing a reaction and you are performing reaction with microscopic particles not even microscopic beyond that nucleus Uh, earlier your uh, atoms were considered as fundamental particles then it was nucleus and then inside nucleus it was proton neutrons and now you have quark gluon plasma and so on and nowadays people are searching for your god particle which is called x boson so these particles are not visible by bare eyes nor by your instruments such as microscopes or Uh, other uh, high resolution devices so what we need is a radiation detector which can sense this okay so indirectly we are viewing these particles so radiation detector is a device which will produce a usable signal which can be sensed by a human being or a physicist or experimentalist what is an ideal detector for a nuclear physicist i will be uh, covering this uh, lecture on radiation detectors with a reference to a nuclear physicist or a atomic physicist who are using facility of accelerators an ideal detector which can uh, provide a full solid angle coverage because in a nuclear reaction essentially you are producing a large number of reaction products and they are going in all directions so we would like to catch each of them and analyze them for some new phenomena so we will would like to have a detector which has a full solid angle coverage with no cracks and fine segmentation psych fine why uh, fine segmentation because this uh, reaction products that are flying in dif uh, different uh, directions have again a, a go to a particular uh, each particle has its unique feature and will go to a particular angle 
सो वी नीड सेगमेंटेशन और स्पेशल इंफॉर्मेशन फॉर एंगुलर इंफॉर्मेशन और स्पेशल इंफॉर्मेशन फॉर एग्जाम्पल कॉमन एग्जाम्पल इज योर एंगुलर डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन देन वी वुड लाइक टू मेजर देयर मोमेंटम और एनर्जी बिकॉज एनर्जी ऑफ द पार्टिकल इज ऑल्सो यूनिक फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई थिंक मेनी ऑफ यू स्टूडेंट्स मस्ट बी यूजिंग दिस रेडियो एक्टिव सोर्सेज इन देयर लेबोरेटरीज इन देयर से फाइनल ईयर ऑफ ग्रेजुएशन और एम एस सी सो मस्ट हैव यूज गामा सोर्स और ए चार्ज पार्टिकल सोर्स सो दे नो दैट ईच ऑफ दिस गामा रेज और ए चार्ज पार्टिकल हैज ए फिक्सड यूनिक एनर्जी फॉर एग्जाम्पल दो सीजियम वन थर्टी सेवन सोर्स देर इज अक गामा लाइन ऑफ एनर्जी सिक्स सिक्सटी टू के वी सो इफ यू हैव ए गामा लाइन ऑफ सिक्स सिक्सटी टू के वी दैट मीन्स दैट गामा लाइन वॉज एमिटेड ड्यूरिंग द डिके ऑफ सीजियम वन थर्टी सेवन न्यूक्लियस अगेन डिटेक्ट ट्रैक एंड आइडेंटिफाई ऑल द पार्टिकल्स ट्रैक मीन्स एज आई टोल्ड यूर लियर we need the special or position information or angular information at which the particle is flying after reaction and identity in terms of its mass and charge nuclear charge z mass means a then fast uh, detector should have a fast response and no dead time that means we want to uh, detect each and every particle without any time loss now the fact is there is nothing like an ideal detector a single detector cannot generate meet our uh, all these requirements neither it can generate all this information since no detector is sensitive to all types of information analogy lies in your eyes eyes can uh, sense light but they cannot sense volume or uh, audible frequencies so each detector is uh, sensitive to a unique particle so they are designed to sense, uh, sense a particular type of radiation in a given energy range only so remedy if we want to detect all kind of particles in a reaction we generally require a combination of detectors so this is what is happening in a typical uh, uh, reaction with an accelerator you are shooting a projectile on a target and depending upon the impact parameter how close this projectile is getting to the target nucleus we will have different reaction channels uh, in the reaction for example if there is a head on collision and uh, the energy of the projectile is well above uh, coulomb barrier then you will have a fusion reaction and if you have a, a impact parameter which is slightly large then you have, will have a grazing uh, co uh, collision which will result in some kind of a trans multi nucleon transfer reaction or a incomplete fusion reaction kind of thing and if this impact parameters are very large then we will will have a pure elastic scattering reaction result is if there is a fusion reaction again this fusion uh, uh, product may be stable or it may be unstable or there may be a incomplete fusion resulting in a non equilibrium nuclei and in case of your uh, complete fusion reaction again if the reaction product uh, is unstable it may fission out resulting in this fission fragments or it may stabilized by the emission of some light particle like gamma or a light particle like proton or alpha but how do we identify these reaction products it is by using these detectors because we have detectors which will sense these different kind of radiation a different detector for gamma ray a different kind of detector for fission fragments a different kind of detector for your light charged particles such as proton and alphas and when you go to high energy uh, uh, physics i think all of you are aware of this uh, large hadron collider facility at uh, cern geneva where they are performing reactions at much higher energies gv they are going to work for hello 
the participants are requested to kindly mute themselves nobody should have their mic on okay i will continue so as i told you earlier your nucleus was considered to be a fundamental particle then it was proton and neutron and you further break them then you have this quark gluon uh, up charm top butyl quarks uh, essentially and nowadays people are looking for the god particle higgs boson and this will be again identify using your large hadron collider and the associated detector instrumentation anyway now coming to different type of radiation detectors i will be talking about gas detectors solid state detectors gas detector is essentially comprises of ionization chambers and proportional counters solid state detectors you have semiconductor detectors like silicon germanium nowadays you have diamond detector cadmium telluride gallium arsenide and so on then you have micro channel plates channel electron multipliers and then you have scintillators Uh, these are uh, uh, classified into uh, two types organic and inorganic and then you have liquid scintillators which are essentially hydrocarbons and uh, each of them have their own unique application now going back to the history of detectors uh, i hope uh, everybody knows about this uh, geiger marsden setup uh, used for uh, your rutherford scattering this was one of the earliest of the detectors and uh, in those days the this detection was done by naked eyes using a optical microscope so what they did is they took a, a radioactive uh, amnesium source 241 amnesium source which emits a alpha particle of energy 5.48 mev and in front of that they placed a thin gold foil and behind the gold foil there was a zinc sulfide screen so whenever the uh, alpha particle from amnesium or a radium source it used to strike this uh, zinc sulfide screen after getting scattered from the gold foil it used to produce a visible scintillation light and that was visible by using this microscope so when ever there was one scintillation they used to uh, record by means of a, a pencil and paper okay one particle has been recorded at this time instant so they will take data say for one hour at a given angle one particular angle and note down the counts and then they will rotate the detector okay keeping the source and foil at fixed position they will rotate the detector and then uh, count the scintillations at the other angle so that way they were uh, recording the angular distribution this was a very tedious task but again this uh, rutherford scattering formula was extracted using this kind of instrument and up to date this is a very perfect formula and is used in modern nuclear physics experiment also later on we had uh, this uh, we wanted to track the particles the trajectory of particles in high energy physics and uh, we wanted to study nuclear disintegration and so on so people used this uh, photographic emulsions or is, uh, which is nothing but silver halide crystals dispersed in uh, gelatin so whenever a particle used to strike and move through these uh, films it used to leave these tracks and when you used to view these uh, tracks uh, this films under a microscope high resolution microscope so you could uh, see the trajectory and in flight disintegration of the particles also you started with one particle suppose there is a disintegration you will have two tracks from a particular point afterwards and of course these had a limited solid angle the uh, area was much uh, smaller so then you went to large area detectors which were nothing but your uh, cloud bubble wilson chamber which had the super uh, saturated vapors of alcohol uh, liquids uh, which was heated and whenever the radiation used to strike again there was a emission of light which was picked up by these cameras now this modern detectors these are essentially electrical in nature whenever a radiation strikes these modern detectors it 
it produces a electrical signal essentially it is converting the kinetic energy of the incoming particle into electrical energy and once you have an electrical signal it can be always digitized and once you have a digitized data it can be stored on your hard disk so you no more need a microscope or a camera to record anything everything is recorded on your hard disk so this is the principle of your modern detector so the principle of modern detectors is transfer of energy from uh, incident radiation to the detector matter and basically two types of uh, interactions are involved okay oh, sir so one is your excitation one is ionization so we are detecting basically two types of particle one is your charged particle other are neutral particles like your photons and neutrons charged particle rely on coulomb interaction between your positive charge of the incoming particle as i told you the principle of your uh, accelerator we start with a negative charge then we produce a positive charge and the re reaction products are uh, generally positively charged and this positive charge when it interacts with the uh, orbital electrons of the detector material it transfers its energy so this this is the principle of detection of charged particle interaction essentially coulomb interaction excitation coulomb interaction can raise electrons in detector to higher energy levels this is the principle used in your semiconductor detectors or ionization in which you can remove the electron completely from an atom and then you can apply suitable means such as electric field in which these ionized electrons and uh, ions will move and the movement of these uh, electrons and ions constitutes a electric current so working principle is very i think simple to understand for uh, neutral entry uh, uh, particles like neutrons you rely on neutral interaction uh, remember this coulomb interaction is atomic interaction and now i am talking about nuclear interaction neutrons as we know they always interact with protons so we use the principle of proton neutron elastic scattering to identify neutrons and in case of gamma we know gammas interact with material using these three uh, phenomena compton scattering photoelectric absorption and pair production from a physicist point of view this uh, central one photoelectric absorption is the most important other two are in fact detrimental they spoil the resolution of the detector now let us talk something about the characteristics of detector first uh, principle is sensitivity how do you select a particular detector material for example i was talking about a semiconductor detectors where we use a silicon germanium why silicon why germanium or why diamond so we need to know the properties of the material so what is the sensitivity of that particular material to a given type of radiation whether that material can it produce a electrical signal for a given type of radiation so we need to select a material which can produce electrical signal for a given type of radiation then response nature of response such as timing response there are experiments where we are looking only for timing application so we will look for a fast response there may be a material which will have a slow response but its energy response may be better so we have to always maintain a balance and depending upon the type of experiment we have to select a material whether we go for a timing response or we go for a energy response of course we have uh, materials which can give us both a fast timing response also and good energy response also so in case of energy response it is the capability to provide the exact kinetic energy information about the, the incident particle different response to different kind of radiation generally we have materials which uh, respond in a different manner to different type of ions for example for light ions it will have a di different response for heavy ions it will have a uh, different kind of response and for neutral uh, particles it may again the response is going to vary 
and this response is re reflected in terms of the shape of the current pulse that is produced by the uh, detector so this shape of the current pulse will be different for the these three types of ions and by doing uh, uh, your pulse shape analysis again we can do particle identification because barely at looking by at the energy or a timing of the particle we cannot make out whether it was a proton or alpha particle both proton and alpha particles can have same energy say 5 5 mev each so how do i identify whether it was a proton or alpha so again we use these uh, type uh, these techniques one is of course pulse shape analysis to identify these particles then linear and non linear response for example a detector material may have a linear response for a particular type of radiation only in a given energy range but outside that energy range or for some other type of particle this response may be non linear linear fine but if it is non linear again we will have a different or a wrong energy information may be interpreted in the data so again we should know about the response energy response about about this detector materials as well radiation interaction so how does this uh, particles when they interact with a given material how do they transfer their energy transfer the energy means they are losing their energy so in a single uh, coulomb interaction a particle generally loses about 1 uh, 500th of its energy and the uh, entire energy lost is in multiple collisions so we have to select a detector material generally we would like to completely stop the particle so that we have the complete energy information of the incident radiation and for that we need to know the stopping power of that particular material because stopping power dictates the specific energy loss in a given length of the material so energy loss in a given length of the material s is given by ratio of minus d by dx minus sign signifies loss of energy that is energy is decre decreasing so d is a differential energy loss dx is the length small length in which this energy is lost so bethe and bloch uh, were the uh, uh, persons uh, or scientist who gave for the first time this uh, uh, formula for the stopping power and uh, this is a very complicated formula so what this formula actually implies uh, if you see this equation uh, this is what the different terms means v is the velocity of the incoming particle z is a nuclear charge of the incoming particle Uh, capital z is the atomic number of the absorber material and uh, i is the average excitation and ionization potential of the absorber that is it is producing an electrical signal so it is also getting ionized and only then it can produce a electrical signal so what this bethe bloch implies that stopping power varies inversely with the energy of the incoming particle that is higher is the energy of the incoming particle smaller will be the energy loss per unit length dx this energy loss d by dx is directly proportional to the square of the nuclear charge that is heavier the particle or uh, higher the nuclear charge more will be the loss of energy per unit length okay so it is dependent uh, upon the Uh, mass of the particle as well as the nuclear charge why nuclear charge i am talking why not only mass why square of nuclear ch charge because as i told you this interaction is between the, because these particles are charged particles and they are interacting with the electrons of the orbital electron of the absorber or detector material so higher the charge more is the probability of coulomb interaction at very lower energies this bethe bloch formula starts failing why because when the energies are very low the tendency of the radiation or this charged particle is to pick up electrons from the absorber material so once it picks up uh, these electrons and becomes a neutral particle then there is no coulomb interaction and then this energy loss becomes undefined 
and in that case particle stops by nuclear interaction or by scattering so what we conclude from bethe bloch formula is that energy loss per unit length is given by the product of mass into the square of nuclear charge and inversely proportional to energy other is how do you select the area or length of the detector material of course as we know the stopping power so this stopping power will define the range of that particle in the given material so you uh, range is defined as the distance penetrated by the charged particle and beyond which no particles can penetrate again this distance is not fixed because we always have statistical fluctuations because uh, as i told you uh, uh, this uh, all the absorber materials or uh, detector material they have a density and uh, it's not always that all particles are going to uh, scatter at a given time so this is the mean range but you know there is a distribution of this range so when you design a detector or you select a material you should uh, select its length which is much larger than the actual range of the particle because there is always a tail which can extend beyond the well beyond the range brack curve okay as i uh, was telling you that uh, this bethe bloch formula this stops uh, this fails beyond a for very low energies so this lower energy is defined typically as 1 mev per nucleon so if you pl plot this d by dx against distance of penetration so once the particle enters the detector material it starts losing its energy so uh, uh, as we have seen uh, as per this uh, bethe bloch formula this energy loss per unit length is inversely proportional to the energy lower the energy higher will be the energy loss so this energy loss keeps on rising or d by dx stop is rising with the penetration depth but beyond a certain point it stops uh, increasing and it st uh, starts following this is the time where it has picked up all the electrons and has become neutral so there is no more coulomb interaction so it will still continue to penetrate beyond that also and this particular peak is called brack peak and this whole curve is called brack curve and this energy is particularly for heavy ions is around 1 mev per nucleon another det detector characteristic is its resolution that is ability to resolve two closely lying peaks we have all uh, studied resolution in our uh, uh, high school and there we generally talk about say microscope or telescope in case of telescope it is the ability to resolve two closely lying stars in case of microscope when we analyze a biological sample say cell structure we want to resolve two closely lying cells or micro organisms in case of detector this can be a, a two energy peaks two timing peaks or two position peaks or mass peaks and uh, this is uh, how uh, mathematically you can express your uh, detector uh, resolution so this is uh, uh, this is generally your standard deviation uh, square root of f o, uh, w by e f is the fano factor w is the energy required to create one charge carrier and e is the energy of the incoming particle and when you multiply the standard deviation or sigma by 2.35 you get the full width at half maximum smaller the value of this full width at half uh, uh, half maximum better will be the resolution of the detector that means smaller the value of fano factor smaller the value of the energy required to create a one charge carrier or this is indirectly the ionization potential of the detector material smaller the value of ionization potential larger is the number of charge carriers that means larger is the value of signal that you get larger the value of the signal better is your signal to noise ratio better will be your uh, resolution of the detector
other characteristic of detector is its efficiency so detector efficiency is essentially of two types absolute efficiency and uh, total uh, intrinsic efficiency absolute or total efficiency is the ratio of the events registered in the detector to the events emitted by the source and this is generally defined by the solid angle of the detector or the area of the detector and the solid angle is defined basically by the uh, distance between the source and the area of the detector intrinsic efficiency is the ratio of events registered to the events impinging on the on the detector it may happen that the uh, events or a radiation has entered the detector but the events are not recorded for example we have a charged particle detector over which a neutral particle like neutron or photon was incident since there was no coulomb interaction so that neutron or photon will not be recorded so in that case its intrinsic efficiency for neutrons and gammas will be zero that time time required by the detector to process an event or duration of the pulse signals once you have created a charge carrier it will take some time to reach its respective electrode so during that particular time if a, a next a radiation arrives that will not be recorded because detector is in principle dead during that time so that is why we are looking generally for a detector which has a very fast response so that its dead time is minimum now we come to the operation modes of the detector so one is your current mode other is your pulse mode current mode it generally measures the average current produced by the ionizing radiations and this is not generally measuring the exact energy but it is only used to detect the presence of a radiation common examples are your radiation monitors in radiation areas such as nuclear reactors or if you go to a hospital where you have this uh, facilities Uh, of uh, mri and so on which uh, uses radiation so there are always radiation monitors to detect the quantity of radiation because a human being should not be exposed to a radiation beyond a certain value so it generally uh, measures the average value which can be measured by using your uh, standard uh, current meters like ammeter common example is your gm counter which is used in your for radiation monitoring now and maybe you are using it in your uh, this uh, experiments in graduation and post graduation also from the physicist point of view this pulse mode is of great importance because amplitude and timing of each individual particle is recorded in real time applications and these are used for spectroscopy applications and it uh, requires very sophisticated front end signal processing electronics now let us start about the types of detector so first we will discuss about gas detectors these were the first of the simplest electrical devices that were developed and it is very simple to fabricate a gas detector these are very cost effective and what you need is just two electrodes a cathode and anode with some detection medium like a gas it can be your normal air also so you apply a suitable potential between these two uh, to these two plates which generates a electric field between these two plates and when the incident radiation it ionizes the gas medium or air between these two plate your electrons and ions are created which before they can recombine they travel to the respective electrodes under the influence of the applied electric field and movement of these charge carriers constitute electric current so this is a very simple principle of these uh, gas detectors and uh, they have been used to detect all kind of radiation uh, photons light and heavy ions cosmic showers elementary particles and so on so this is the pictorial uh, representation of your gas detector you have two plates cathode and anode you apply a electric field so this is a alpha particle and it ionizes so electrons are going to drift towards the anode and the heavy ions uh, which are positively charged by the removal of electron they will drift towards the 
cathode. And types of detector, depending upon the design of the detector, that is the uh, amount of electric field applied or uh, electric field, I should say, not uh, electric uh, voltage, uh, it can be operated in ionization mode, proportional mode. And these are the other type of designs, cathode chambers, uh, resistive plate chambers, uh, gas electron multipliers, and so on. And applications, uh, nuclear and particle physics, atomic molecular materials, and nowadays they are very frequently used in your medical imaging techniques. I will come to these applications also. So this is what happens is, so if you have a cathode and anode, and if there's no electric field present between them, so once a, a gas molecule is ionized, since there was no electric field, they will, what will happen? They will recombine. Now you apply some voltage, say typically uh, half volt to one volt per centimeter per tor kind of field. So we, when, whenever we talk about uh, this uh, gas detectors, we talk in terms of reduced electric field, which is uh, generally the electric field is volts per meter, but we talk in terms of volts per meter per tor it's because amount of voltage that has to be applied depends upon the pressure of the gas or density of the gas between these two uh, plates, uh, uh, electrodes. So in ion, this is called your ionization region when they start drifting towards their respective electrode and typical gains are one. And this region is very useful for your energy measurements and uh, also used for your particle identification using your differential energy loss method. I will come to that later on. Now you start increasing the voltage between the two uh, electrodes. Increasing the voltage means you are increasing the electric field. As a result, the charge carriers that are generated, especially the electrons, they start drifting towards the uh, anode with a higher velocity because now your uh, field is high. That means your potential is high. So this potential energy is now going to get converted into the kinetic energy of the electrons. So once the electrons start moving with higher kinetic energies, they acquire higher energies to knock out electrons from the other gas molecules. So now it is not the incident radiation which is ionizing the gas molecule. It is the electrons that were created are now further ionizing the gas molecules. So you know, higher order ionization is taking place, secondary, tertiary and so on. And gradually a stage comes when there is a avalanche multiplication taking place. So in such cases, the gain, which was earlier unity, can go to four to five orders of magnitude. And this is very useful. But uh, since you are collecting the charge very fast, because electrons are moving at now much higher speed, so charge collection will be fast. So your timing response is also now improving. Signal is also becoming stronger. But now there is no proportionality between the original incident energy loss. So this region cannot be used for measurement of your energy anymore. This is useful for your timing application. So for energy application, we use this ionization region. So for timing applications, we use this proportional or avalanche region. You can further increase the voltage. Then it goes to your saturated steamer mode. Saturated mode, steamer mode means beyond this, even if you increase the voltage, there will be no increase in the gain. Okay. And you further increase the voltage, you are in the Geiger mode where discharges are going to happen. That means there will be a breakdown of gas. So in a GM counter, there is always a breakdown of gas and there is an electrical circuit which will cut off the voltage and restore it. Because we are only interested in measuring the presence of radiation. We are not actually counting the number of radiation. So I hope this uh, operational principle of gas detector is clear to everybody. Ionization chamber, again, this is of uh, two types. One is your uh, transverse uh, geometry mode, other is your uh, uh, axial field board. Applications, as I've already talked about, it is used for energy measurements. And you can design it in such a way that you can use it for a particle identification method using this D by DX method. 
because we know that differential energy loss in a given length is directly proportional to the square of nuclear charge so it can be used in principle for z identification of a radiation and by using suitable designs you can make it position sensitive also or you can combine these detectors with your silicon detectors to have hybrid detectors also gas detector will be only used for measuring differential energy loss silicon detector will be used for stopping the particle remember silicon has a being a semiconductor or a solid state material has a much higher density as compared to your gas so combination of this two can always reduce the length of the detector and this is useful in some application so you can make a hybrid detector also so this is a typical transfer field ionization chamber this is the incoming particle why do we call it a transfer field ionization chamber because the electric field which is from cathode to anode is perpendicular to the direction of the incoming particle and here you see that we have segmented anode into three or four parts so that each part measures differential energy loss you add all the four you will get the total energy so we will adjust the gas pressure according to the incoming energy of the particle in such a way that the particle is going to stop in the last segment and this differential energy loss since it is proportional to square of the nuclear charge will give you the identity of the z identity of the particle how this d by dx is realized i will give you a very simple example you take the case of a proton and alpha so how do their z uh, square ratio vary suppose we have a proton which has an energy 5 mev we take an alpha which has an energy 5 mev so in a given length say delta e1 what will be the energy loss so this mz square ratio of your alpha and proton is 16 into 1 alpha is a m4 z2 so mz square is 16 proton both m and z are 1 so alpha is going to lose 16 times more energy as compared to your proton so this is a working principle of a d by dx ionization chamber you compare proton you compare alpha and lithium then it will be for lithium 7 it is mz square is 63 and for alpha it was 16 so now this ratio is reduced to 4 is to 1 so when you go higher up uh, on the higher side of the atomic uh, this periodic table this ratio gradually decreases and a stage comes when this ratio becomes unity so this d by dx technique can be only used for your lighter ions say up to a, a nickel or say up to zinc i will say z30 region so you must have noticed that there is not only cathode and uh, not only a, a anode there is a frisch grid also why do we require a, a frisch grid see when a electron moves towards the anode this movement of electron constitutes induces a signal on this anode so one uh, part is of course uh, your uh, actual charge collection by the respective electrodes but this movement of electrons also induces there is a induced current also longer the length of the uh, this uh, path higher will be the value of the induced current so for same energy loss but uh, for the larger solid angle of the detector particle may be entering at this position or the particle may be entering at this position they are traveling the charges are traveling different length and they, they will have a different value of induced current so we will get a higher signal in one case where it is much away from the anode and lower value of the induced current when it is near one so what do you do is you uh, introduce a transparent grid where the actual uh, current will be induced and this is generally grounded so whatever the induced current is there it will be grounded and the electrons since this is transparent this is a wire mesh once this reaches in this region then irrespective whether it was generated on this point or this point they are now going to induce same value and the charge collection of course is always similar so indirectly this is 
removing your position dependency in the transfers direction of the incoming particle i hope this this is very tricky to understand but we always need a fresh grid in such kind of geometry this is how it is explained this is without a fresh grid you have this induced current and when you introduce a fresh grid this original part is grounded so this is how the signal formation is taking place this is your axial field geometry here the electric field here the particle is entering from this side your electric field is along the direction of the incoming particle you have this guard electrodes i will uh, explain you in the next slide why do we need these uh, rings equipotential rings or guard electrodes to shape the electric field so in this case also this is called a bragg curve detector we adjust the gas pressure in such a way that particle stops in the active length itself and this is used for your particle identification also because lighter particles they will penetrate deeper heavier particles will stop earlier so your transition time of the charge carriers will be different and as a result you will have different pulse electric uh, current uh, pulse shapes so if you do a pulse shape analysis you can do particle identification so this slide explains why you need this uh, equipotential rings or electric field gradient in case there is no gradient at the edges your fields will start bulging what will happen is at the edges if the charge carriers are created they may go out of the active area so that charge will be lost so it will result in inferior resolution at the edges but if you shape them then you can see this electric field is now more or less uniform at edges also and this is what i was saying axial field detector ionization chamber can be combined with a silicon detector to have a hybrid detector so in the previous case you have a much longer length this can be as long as 30 cm because this gas density is very small and silicon density is much higher so you can reduce the length of the detector by combining the two so gas detector will uh, <coughs> measure your differential energy loss for z identification e is the a silicon is your stopping detector or e detector next we go to multi wire proportional counter and uh, this was uh, invented by cherpak in late 60s as such proportional counters uh, had existed even in uh, uh, late 50s and 60s also and in its simplest form you take two parallel plates gap between these two parallel plates is very small and you apply a very high electric field at a lower gas pressure so that you have a very high reduced field so you have your strong multiplication taking place to have very fast timing signal and higher signals we require this in case in case of minimum ionizing particles like your x rays x ray photons because x ray photons since they don't have any coulomb interaction they deposit very small amount of energy so this needs uh, your uh, inherent multiplication within detector to have a usable signal but what we need in an experiment especially high energy physics experiments even in now nuclear physics experiment we need position information also so cherpak invented this multi wire proportional counter and for that he received nobel prize in 1992 he made first multi wire proportional counter in late 60s maybe i think 68 or 69 but he received the nobel prize in 92 and where you use uh, parallel wires and if you can uh, <coughs> read each wire individually you can get the position information and uh, it is now not only in high energy physics uh, chapak was a high energy physicist he made this detector for your uh, sun collaboration large hadron collider uh, uh, collaboration in those days it was not large hadron collider it was electron positron collider but now this device is a very powerful instrument in nuclear physics and atomic physics also so these are fabricated using your gold plated tungsten wires diameter varying from 10 micrometer to 50 micrometer and wire pitches are typically it can vary from 300 micrometer to 2 millimeter and this electrode separation is between 2 to 5 mm electrodes you can have multi step counters also 3 4 5 and position information you can use a resistive charge dvn or delay line technique 
so this is how a multi wire proportional uh, looks like so these are your wires uh, this is the orthogonal view these are the two plates so you apply a very say high po uh, positive potential on these wires and your electric field lines are so on and this is this is charpak this is student soli and this is you can see you can make a very large LED detector this is i think almost 2 meters in uh, width and something like uh, half a meter in uh, length so as this charge carriers are generated uh, once your uh, this gas volume is ionized they drift towards the respective electrodes so this electrons they are drifting towards the anode anode wires so the field on the surface of the wires are very high all of us know the electric uh, field at the surface of a cylindrical con uh, conductor is given by this formula okay and it is inversely proportional to the radius in this case radius is the distance a okay so thinner the diameter of the wire higher will be the electric field on the surface and once it reaches the surface electric field is so high that your avalanche multiplication is taking place this is how a avalanche multiplication is pictureized okay so this is how you get very high ionization once there is a ionization taking place okay this molecules are also getting excited to higher energy states and once they de excite they also emit radiation and these radiations can also ionize your gas molecules so what can happen is even in the absence of radiation you will have avalanche multiplication taking place so it is very essential to absorb these these uh, secondary radiations which are coming from de excitation so always uh, we use a gas which has some quencher for example in a argon gas we add methane gas which will absorb these photons so this is how a multi wire proportional counter actually looks like this is schematic view so this is a three electrode geometry these are the wire frames so you have a central conducting electrode this can be a cathode or anode depending upon the type of potential you apply it depends essentially upon the material that you use and these are your wires and these wires you can see they are orthogonally oriented so this will give you the horizontal uh, position or x position and this will give you the vertical position or y position how you get the position either you can read e each wire individually or you can interconnect them with a resistive chain or a delay line change or you can have a multi step counter this first one is a three uh, single step counter this is a multi step counter in this you add a drift space at the entrance so you ionize a charge these charge carriers drift into this avalanche region and there they further get multiplied so now you have a two step amplification so in earlier stage we had a gain of say something like 4 to 5 orders of magnitude in this case you can get a gain of two orders of magnitude higher so in earlier case if it was say four orders you can get six orders of magnitude due to this multi step counter how do we get position you can have this resistive charge dvn or you can connect them with a delay line delay line is nothing but a inductor capacitor circuit so it introduces a phase shift between the signal and this is pictorially depicted in this formula so this is how your signal is getting delayed if you had this several wires okay so from this position to this position it will move into time so by suitable measurement of time with respect to a reference clock we can get the position or if you are doing a resistive charge dvn you simply apply your kirchhoff's current dvn law and you can see when you move from one node to other node your signal amplitude is decreasing closer to your uh, this uh, collecting uh, feed through higher will be the signal farther away you are from uh, you will signal will be getting reduced in this ratio and this is how you get the position this is a position a two dimensional position sensitive 
multi-wire proportional counter, and this is it's a two-dimensional spectra. So this is now you can use for your imaging techniques also. You can see this thin gold-plated tungsten wires, and they are barely visible by the eyes. So these have to be stretched and manually soldered on these pads. So as I told you, this wire separation this will uh, determine the position resolution of your detector as well as the timing resolution. Closer the wires, more uniform is the field, faster is the charge collection, and also you get a better position resolution. So this is one millimeter wire spacing, then you have a half millimeter wire spacing, and this is your 0.3 millimeter wire spacing. And this is a typical uh, time of flight system. So why time of flight system? Because time of flight will determine your velocity. We know energy is equal to half mv square. So once you have the velocity, once you have the energy, you can get the mass of the particle. And by time of flight, since I told you in a given nuclear reaction, many different type of reaction products are being uh, produced. So you can separate them by using this time of flight technique, uh, technique because all of them will have different energies, so they will move with different velocities. So this is one typical example. Your fission products can be separated by your projectile, which may be a lighter uh, projectile like oxygen, or if it's a gold target, this is a gold recoil. And uh, we use this mass spectrometers, position sensitive counters are used in mass spectrometers. We know this magnetic spectrometers, they bend the particles as per their nuclear charge or mass and charge. BQV is equal to mv square by r is the standard formula. So particles will move in different trajectories under the influence of a magnetic field depending upon their mass. And if you have a position sensitive counter, so you will get different masses at different position. And if this has an ionization chamber also, this is how a delta, typical delta E spectra looks like. Also, these gas detectors can be uh, made in different geometries. So this is a uh, two electrode geometry where you have one electrode which has concentric rings. So this will give you the polar angle uh, theta. And you can have a cake-like electrode which will give you phi angle. So once you have phi and theta, then what you have to do is you have to simply uh, apply these formulas. Law of momentum conservation, P1 cos theta 1. Uh, P1 sin theta 1 is equal to P2 sin theta 2 uh, and you can get your mass of the incoming particle. So this is how mass identification is done and if you have uh, you have the energy also E is equal to half mv square so you can further improve the resolution of the system. So, And this is another example of a gas electron multiplier. Due to shortage of time, I will skip this. This is your cathode strip chamber. So instead of wires, you can take a, a copper strip. You can etch strips out of it. And you can read each strip in individually. So the particle, if it is striking this particular strip, so it will induce maximum signal on this strip. But it doesn't mean it will not uh, induce signal on the neighboring strips. But this will be, this will gradually get weaker as it moves away from the point of interaction. So you can use this uh, center of gravity method, you can record the, all of them and by looking at the ratio of their uh, this amplitudes, you can get a resolution which is much better than the pitch of these strip. And this is how you get resolutions as good as sometimes less than 100 micrometers. And these find applications in your medical imaging. This is an example of a resistive plate chamber. I hope most of you have heard about this uh, upcoming facility in southern part of India, Indian Neutrino Observatory, and that is going to apply, uh, apply this uh, resistive plate chamber detectors, where detectors will be operated at very high electric field in streamer mode. In normal avalanche mode, you still need a electronic circuit to further amplify the signal. But in streamer mode, signal strength is already very large. So you can directly digitize these signal. And this is, I will give you one example of a magnetic spectrometer, which has a target chamber and a start transmission type of detector. And uh, 
your reaction products are detected at the focal plane behind this magnetic spectrometer it has a multi wire position sensitive multi wire proportional counter at the focal plane and a, a ionization chamber which measures multiple differential energy losses for z identification so if you have time of flight and z identification these are the different parts of the uh, detector this is the ionization chamber segmented and this is the multi wire proportional counter these are the three electrode and this is the delay line and this is your delta e spectra so as i told you you go on the upper side z is equal to 50 this is the delta e on the y axis so higher the mass or higher the z more is the energy loss okay lighter the particle less is the energy loss so you plot differential energy loss against the total energy you get different contours depending upon the different type of particles z is equal to 34 z is equal to 50 and now you combine it with the time of flight so you get different isotopes of calcium 40 calcium 41 calcium and so on so time of flight gave you mass a and this gave you z and this is these are your detectors in the high energy physics at uh, sun this is the atlas detector you can see a person standing here so you can see the size of the detector so we need a very large area detector for your high energy physics experiment so in a large hadron collider the collision of the beams is taking place at this point and the reaction products are flying in all direction so you want to detect each and everything and since these are very high energy particles so you need a much higher larger detector to detect them now i go to the next part that is the silicon detector part semiconductor detectors operational principle is very simple these are nothing but pn junction diodes and they are always operated in reverse bias mode normally use a diode in forward bias mode but this are used in reverse bias mode why reverse bias mode so as to increase the depletion region you have a depletion region formed whenever you combine a pn n junction and when you reverse bias it this re uh, depletion region increases why depletion region because it is depleted of free charge carriers and whenever a radiation strikes this uh, material it will create electron hole pairs okay so this is the uh, uh, principle of now excitation i am talking about early in case of gas detector it was ionization now i am talking about excitation so electron hole pairs are created and before they can recombine they are swept away by the applied electric field so this is how reverse bias helps so we have depleted no or no current and when radiation there only then current is flowing and this is how uh, the current signal looks like you have the electric field from say going from n to p side this is a standard principle you have electric field from negative to positive side so at the p side the field is maximum so it is generally this side which faces the incoming particle and you have electrons and holes both moving so your contribution from uh, to the total current is coming from both electron and holes in case of silicon detector holes have a very uh, the mobility of holes is almost one third of your electrons so you can see that mobility is very small for as compared to your electron but total current is the sum of the two again like your gas detector this uh, pn junction can also be segmented by using suitable techniques so as to have a position sensitive silicon detectors and depending upon the width of the strips you can uh, get the uh, uh, as small position uh, resolution as possible this your modern digital cameras they generally use this semiconductor detectors in their pixel so you talk about 1 megapixel camera 2 megapixel camera so what is basically happening is you have a, a, a <coughs> silicon detector say inside silicon or gallium arsenide it can be which is two dimensionally position sensitive you have strips uh, on one side on the back side you have strips which are orthogonally oriented and you keep on reducing you uh, the pitch or you make the strips as narrow as, as possible so the pixel resolution will also keep on improving 
you can make the surface resistive also and apply your charge deviation method to have the position as explained in case of your proportional counter <coughs> so this is a mass spectra from alpha spectrum for a this kind of resistive charge deviation method again silicon crystal can be grown or etched in any kind of geometry you can have a circular or annular detector it is you have concentric rings and sectors in this case also to have polar angle or uh, and phi angle in case of proportional counters you don't get energy information but in case of silicon detector apart from your angles you will have the energy information also because this silicon detectors have a very good energy resolution much better than your gas detector reason is that for a gas detector which is generally operated with the isobutane gas you need something like 25 electron volts to create one electron ion pair in case of silicon detector you require 3.6 ev of energy to create one electron hole pair so energy required to create one charge carrier is much less so that means more number of charge carriers will be created per unit energy loss higher as i told you higher the uh, uh, charge carrier created better will be your resolution so this is where silicon detectors score over the gas detectors and again you can combine to uh, one thin and one thick silicon detector to have a delta e detector germanium detector these are essentially used for your gamma detector so as i told you that your stopping and uh, power or d by dx is not only dependent upon the uh, type of incoming particle but also upon the density of the absorber or radiation detector material so since photons they are uh, uh, in the category of minimum ionizing particles so they don't have any coulomb interaction so they will interact uh, gammas will interact by your photoelectric effect or compton scattering and so on so to detect them we need a higher density material gas detectors are ruled out because as i told you they are they are very low density detectors silicon again has a very low density something like 2.3 grams per uh, centimeter cube germanium has a much higher density as compared to your silicon other advantage of germanium is that as compared to your silicon detector it can be very easily grown in large areas that means thicker crystals can be grown in case of silicon it is very difficult to uh, grow a thick crystal even if you manage to grow a thick crystal the electron mobilities in silicon are very small so the charge collection times are very large and there is a finite probability that recombination can take place but in case of gas this germanium detector your mobilities are very large density is high also they require much less energy to create one electron hole pair in case of silicon it was 3.6 ev in case of germanium it is 2.7 mev so they are used for high resolution gamma and x ray spectroscopy of course when you have a lower ionization potential problem is that these electrons can acquire energy and jump into conduction band even at room temperature even in the absence of radiation so these detectors are routinely operated at liquid nitrogen temperature so this is one example of indian national gamma array facility at inter university accelerator so these are your germanium detectors and these are your liquid nitrogen divars which always uh, keep this uh, crystals of germanium at liquid nitrogen temperature i will skip this part so resolution wise uh, as i told you there can be this uh, comparison between a germanium detector and a sodium iodide detector sodium iodide detector requires much uh, higher energy to create a charge carrier so you can see this resolution is a very broad peak and within this broad peak many peaks were submerged which are resolved by your germanium detector now i come to the last part of the detectors that is a scintillation detector so this works on the phenomena of ionization so uh, excitation so you excite a atom or a molecule and when it de excite it emits a 
photon whose energy may lie in the visible region and by using a suitable technique like photoelectric effect this light energy can be converted into electrical energy so this is how it is shown this is incident radiation scintillating material then there is a visible light which is made to fall on a photocathode photocathode material emits electrons and then you can multiply the electrons by using suitable materials to have a usable electrical signal again this scintillation material should satisfy following requirement you cannot pick up any material so first of all high efficiency for conversion of incoming uh, energy of the radiation to fluorescent radiation that means this kinetic energy of the incoming radiation has to be converted into fluorescent radiation the scintillating uh, material should be such that it should be transparent to the light radiation and emit otherwise it will absorb its own radiation so that means it has to be transparent like a glass okay then emission in the spectral range to match the response of the photocathode material all of us uh, must have done this uh, experiments on photoelectric effect we must have observed when you change the wavelength of the light or uh, from say so you go to red light to blue light or so on the electric current emitted by the photocathode material is also changing that is the amplitude of the current or the amount of the current produced so this photocathode material have a different response to the different wavelength of light so we have to select a material whose emission response matches with the photocathode material again linear response and it should have a short decay constant for fast timing applications two phenomena are taking place fluorescence re emission occurs immediately after absorption okay that is photon emission is taking place immediately light emission phosphorescence there will be a delayed there will be a delay that depends upon the energy levels between your atom so this is generally not good because this happens because of the presence of meta stable states in the atom or molecule of the material that we are using as the detector and these are the various phenomena which are taking place i will skip this one because of the shortage of time and again there are some materials which uh, are very good uh, scintillation material but most of the time their spectral response is not uh, such that it matches with the spectral response of your photocathode material so what we can do is we can add dopants like in a semiconductor we add dopants to make a pn junction similarly we can add dop dopants in a scintillating material to uh, these dopants are called activators so they create some sites in between and uh, light is generally emitted between these sites and that uh, wavelength responds to the spectral response of your photocathode material so for example uh, whoever has used a sodium iodide detector we have thallium as the activator to improve upon the response of the detector in case of your uh, inorganic uh, in, in, in case of your organic scintillators okay these are generally molecular in nature and most of the time they are used for your uh, neutron detection why do we use hydrocarbons because hydrocarbons have higher density of hydrogen and neutrons can be only detectable detected by neutron proton scattering so these are molecular in nature and here also you can see because of this presence of meta stable uh, states you have not only fluorescence taking place you have phosphorescence also taking place so you have this different response times which are sometimes useful for your particle identification also and here also you can add say certain materials okay like uh, you can take a material such as benzene or xylene and add these materials like uh, uh, polystyrene and so on these are called wavelength shifter these shift uh, change the wavelength of the light so that it matches with the response of your photocathode material so these are the example of your liquid scintillators and plastic scintillators these are hydrocarbons mostly used for your
detection of neutrons but these neutro uh, these uh, that doesn't mean it not it will not be sensitive to other kind of radiations they will be sensitive to your gammas as well as protons also and that is why they have a different time response gammas they always interact with the electrons by means of compton scattering electrons the scattered electrons they move much faster so this electrical current or a light response it decays much faster for your gamma rays in case of neutrons since they are act, uh, interacting with your uh, protons protons move much slower so decay times are larger and when you go to say protons and alphas okay alphas being heavier again this interaction is slow so decay times will be larger so this uh, this is how the, your uh, Uh, shape of the current pulse will vary and by suitably analyzing this current shape you can identify which one was gamma neutron or alpha and this is how your photomultiplier tube looks like so this is a transparent glass material over which your scintillating uh, material is pasted okay it is coupled using a silicon grease and then it is wrapped in a light tight material so whenever a radiation strikes the scintillating material emits light it is made to fall on a photocathode material okay this photocathode material emits electron this electron fa falls on another photocathode material which knock uh, which knock knocks out electron and then you have a voltage gradient so these electrons get accelerated in this gradient and this is uh, i think uh, much better shown in this picture and your current amplification takes place so in a photomultiplier tube you get a much stronger signal and this is the technique of uh, your pulse shape analysis this is how you can identify your gamma and neutron this is your uh, timing uh, axis so since gammas were decaying much faster so they are on the lower side of the timing axis neutrons were decaying uh, slower so they are on the higher side so this is uh, how you can identify your gammas and photon uh, neutrons so these are the typical example of your uh, applications of uh, these scintillators this is the bismuth germanium oxide multi uh, multiplicity filter sodium iodide spectrometer and these are your liquid scintillator national array of neutron detector facility at iuac so you have a scattering chamber of uh, a vacuum scattering chamber in the center which houses gas proportional counters which detect heavy ions in coincidence with the neutrons that are emitted in a nuclear reaction neutrons are picked up by your liquid scintillators so you can detect all kind of particles in a given reaction you can mount a germanium detector also for gammas so again Uh, these are plastic sheets of your uh, organic material so these are position sensitive you can put a photomultiplier tube on both the ends of the plastic sheet light deviation will take place and depending on the amount of light as in case of charge deviation you can get the position of the incoming particle this is a typical array of scintillators at sun in atlas so this is a uh, uh, i will i think do i have time or should i stop here hello yes dr akhil you can take uh, uh, five hello. minutes yes sir yes dr yes, akhil sir. yes sir you have time yeah please uh, have... if you uh -huh. uh, would you Go like ahead. to speak another okay. 10 minutes or what is it around it is around 8 o'clock now yeah yeah no no would you like to speak 10 minutes or more or 10 minutes 10 minutes yeah yeah okay there are one or two questions in the chat box when you yeah. finish you can see those questions or we can read them out for you sure sure so uh, this is another type of uh, uh, solid state detector these are called micro channel plates where you take a glass substrate and then you make holes uh, at a given angle in these glass uh, substrate and these holes are the walls of these holes which are cylindrical in nature are filled with some kind of semiconductor materials and this glass has a metal coating on both the side conductive metal coating and these holes have a semiconductor material and these channels these are generally oriented at some angle so whenever an electron falls uh, 
in these channels okay it will knock out electrons from these material and this glass substrate as i told you this has a metal coating on both the side so you apply a voltage gradient say apply a negative potential on this side a positive potential on this side positive potential means this can be at ground potential with uh, so this electrons will get accelerated towards the positive side and in this process it will they acquire energy and knock out further electrons typical thickness of these glass substrate is less than a millimeter and uh, electrons acquire velocity as high as say something like uh, 10 to power 6 to 10 to power 7 meters per second and in a small length of say less than a millimeter charge collection is very fast so and charge multiplication is also taking place so the signal strength is very high and because of the faster collection your timing is very good so these are used generally for your timing applications and you can combine these uh, two micro ch channel plates and uh, the, to further enhance the gain of course your timing will become inferior because now drift length has increased but your gains are improving so for certain kind of particles like photons which uh, as i told you come in the category of minimum ionizing particles because there's no coulomb interaction we generally use two or sometimes three micro channel plates use of two micro channel plates is, is a standard practice this is called chevron configuration and when you use three of them this is called z configuration and uh, this can be made transmission type by using the phenomenon of secondary electron emission where you use a carbon foil and uh, whenever a heavy ion comes it knocks out electrons from these uh, carbon foil which by means of a suitable voltage gradient uh, using a instrument called electrostatic mirror mirror is directed towards the micro channel plate and we at this particular point your multiplication of signals take place and you can have a further modify the design you can have a, a position sensitive anode which is just like your delay line mwpc as i had explained you to get the position information also so this is how this uh, detector looks like so this is a carbon foil and this is a electrostatic mirror formed by this wire frames so the electrons that are knocked out are directed into this micro channel plate so the heavy ion will pass through this so this is a transmission type of detector and you can have say two or three micro channel plates to track such a uh, micro channel plates to track the particle so you will have the position information as well as the time of flight and from time of flight you can get the mass information also but main thing is this since the drift length is very small less than a millimeter in contrast to a multi wire proportional counter where the drift length is something like 3 to 3 millimeter your timing resolution is much better in your mcp in fact this is the fastest solid state detector timing resolution is as good as 25 picoseconds can be achieved with this detector and this is a typical example of corse setup in europe which is used for your fission mass identification in the fission experiments i will touch one very small part it is not only your uh, basic or fundamental physics that uh, detector have applications they have industrial applications also one common example is your metal detectors that we this uh, smoke detectors that we see in your nowadays uh, uh, cinema halls malls and uh, even in colleges so this is nothing but there is a metal plate and there is a air between these two metal plate and you place a amnesium alpha source so whenever a alpha source uh, alpha particle passes through this space it ionizes the air and as a result the current will flow so whenever there is a fire this smoke settles in this area which prevents ionization of the air as a result it will hinder the flow of current that means there will be no current flowing so there is a circuit which activates an alarm whenever there is a current is not flowing so this is the working principle of a smoke detector so this is just like your gas ionization chamber with a radioactive source till the current is flowing alarm will not blow 
as soon as the current stops uh, uh, flowing there will be an alarm and these are your image int intensifiers and uh, night vision objects you must have seen many of the movies in which they nowadays they show this uh, commando operations the uh, commandos are operating during the night and they have this image intensifiers fit on their uh, rifles also and also on their uh, this uh, head mask also these image intensifiers have nothing or nothing else but they have your this micro channel plates and they have a say sensor or a photocathode material which is sensitive to a particular radiation which is uh, visible in the night and that emits electrons and intens intensifies these Im images so this is one another typical example and thermal imaging is also used these again uses your uh, uh, pixel semiconductor detectors and they are normally fitted uh, with your aircrafts and drones so even at a, from a very large distance during the night they can spot the movement of artillery of the enemy and uh, muon tomography this is another uh, upcoming field muons are emitted are emitted from the space and they can be picked up by your detectors and this can be used to scan your materials in your container normally we are using x ray scanners at the airports but uh, your containers metal containers they are made up of thick steel and if somebody is trying to smuggle a, a radioactive material it cannot be detected by your x ray scanners so one can use your high energy muons these are nothing but high energy protons and you can uh, cover your container with your position sensitive counters and pick up these radioactive material this is how cargo scanning is done with your muons so this uh, technique is still under development but it will be very useful technique and of course using a multi wire proportional counter a two dimensional position sensitive multi wire proportional counters people develop this medical imaging or radiography technique normally we use a x ray film but x ray films have a limitation in their resolution using your modern this high resolution uh, detectors and digital techniques you can get a much better picture this is example such a image cannot be created by your standard x ray film so these have been used by using your multi wire proportional counters okay so this is a bat and you can use digital magnification techniques to magnify this claw okay and so on for industrial applications also so if you have a smaller wire spacing you can get a better resolution for larger wire spacing say 1 mm resolution is like this one so positron emission tomography technique this again utilizes your silicon pixel detectors so you have a photocathode material which is an cesium iodide material so radiation a gamma ray photon falls on it in the positron emission tomography it knocks out electrons from cesium iodide and this electrons are then accelerated by your voltage gradient to higher energy and these are picked up by your silicon pixel detectors to generate this image of the tumor inside your body so i will stop here yes uh... so these are the references there are uh, so many questions uh, in the chat box can uh, um, doctor uh, doctor chingan can you see the chat box or should we read them uh, out for you uh, it will be better if you can read out because i am still in presentation mode yeah okay fine i'll do it please give me a minute so yeah. it's good that you have already included so many references because they have they generally so students are generally interested and let me tell you before i read the questions i must say that your uh, your talk inspires me to invite you to a more detailed talk another day where a lot of portion which you had to skip because of paucity of time could be dealt with in detail maybe only a day of accelerators 
for uh, accelerators and detector related physics that would be very nice so joseph asks how can we detect neutrons yes see neutrons are uh, neutral particles so they cannot be uh, detected by means of your coulomb interaction coulomb interaction means atomic interaction so here we use the principle of a uh, nuclear reactions so neutrons only interact with protons so we have to select a material which has a higher density of protons so as you must have seen we are using a hydrocarbons or organic scintillators hydrocarbons have a very high density of protons so neutron proton scattering takes place neutron will uh, will uh, uh, strike your protons and once these protons move inside your scintillating material say liquid scintillator it will get excited and emit a light and then this light is converted into electrical signal i think yes so uh, uh, yeah another question is can neutrinos be detected using the method of scintillation yes neutro neutrinos can be detected using the method of scintillation see why we are using a resistive plate chamber for detecting neutrinos at ino is because Uh, because of uh, finances uh, making a resistive plate chamber is much cheaper and easier than making a scintillating material because scintillating material requires your photomultiplier tubes which are very expensive so as such your scintillating uh, scintillators will have a much higher efficiency and much better signal to noise ratio but we are using rpcs and this is a very common practice in other parts of the world also because rpcs can be very easily made with in large areas making a big size photomultiplier tube is much more difficult so th there are issues on uh, this uh, capital issues civil uh, this uh, issues uh, so on yeah. uh, how do we calibrate gm counter calibration for what that energy is... calibration or uh, timing calibration or just from the point of you uh, or just to use it as a counter so that uh, joseph kindly specify what you want uh, chetna asked sir how does an alpha guard works alpha guard works what is alpha guard i don't know I'm i mean I, i didn't follow the question either okay joseph asks uh, for just as a counter the previous question which i asked okay so just how do we counter? calibrate a counter yeah so what uh, to do that you have to take a radioactive source of known activity okay and in that case you have to uh, place the source at a given angle so activity means i know that this source is emitting this number of photons or charged particles generally it is used for the detection of photons so these are the number of photons uh, being emitted emitted per second okay and this is the solid angle of my gm counter so this is the number of photons that will be incident on that gm counter and how uh, so these were the number of photons emitted per second but actually how many i have counted so that ratio will give me the calibration as well as the efficiency also okay so uh, how geometry of the anode in gm counter affects the sensitivity of the gm counter see geometry means a, a gm counter is a type of cylindrical proportional counter where you have a single wire running through a through the axis of a cylinder so depending upon the diameter of the wire depending upon the distance of that wire uh, to, uh, towards the wall of the this cylinder that will determine the uh, working of the your uh, gm counter so smaller the gap higher will be the field otherwise if the gaps are large then you have to apply much higher voltage to achieve those kind of field which may become sometimes impractical okay so smriti asks how are these channel walls different from dynodes or i would say how are they better so, channel walls means for micro channel plate yeah, i yes. guess yeah see these are not very different uh, i will say but in case of say uh, dynode uh, dynodes are much bulky 
first of all of this uh, photo multiplier tubes other is if you okay i will go towards the picture okay you can see there is a certain amount of length involved it goes from this dynode to this dynode to this dynode this length is something like 10 to 15 cm so the transition length that the electron has to travel is much larger whereas in case of your micro channel plate as i told you this length is much smaller okay this is less than a millimeter so your charge collection is much faster but of course this length is very small so your gains will be also smaller as compared to your photo multiplier tube so there is a adjustment between the transition time and gain and of course these uh, uh, photo multiplier tubes are much more robust as compared to your mcps because you have a glass substrate which is less than a millimeter thickness and these are very brittle so they can get damaged very easily so this is the difference okay so the last question is how does bf3 counter works bf3 counter yeah how does it work and uh, chetna also as alpha guard helps in detection of radon in atmosphere alpha guard maybe uh, it's a kind of a detector using some alpha particle source or something like that how would you uh, detect radon it would be just that only okay so chetna we will find out what you what you want to find out but uh, i think presently he has not spoken about alpha guards as such but i'll yeah. get we'll get you the answer it's not a problem it's not a problem we'll get a problem bf3 counter is a boron fluoride uh, yeah. counter trifluoride yeah so this boron these are essentially they are uh, of course uh, i have not talked about this boron fluoride counter also but they are essentially used for your uh, this uh, radiation monitoring yes uh, most of the times and boron boron has a very high amount of sensitive to your neutrons so this can thermalize your neutrons okay if you have very high energy neutrons high energy neutrons interaction with your say uh, uh, typical hydrocarbon detector efficiency will be very low because if uh, neutrons are very high this uh, scattering probability also goes down or nuclear interaction probability goes down but when you have a boron okay it will moderate or it will slow down the neutron to, uh, neutrons to an energy which will be uh, then used for your uh, reaction or uh, this uh, neutron proton reaction okay so that's all for today and so i think uh, i we all thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be a resource person today with us and we are really very thankful i am thankful from nasi delhi chapter initiative side my co organizing team and we really thank you dr chengan and i am sure we would uh, be happy that if you, if you would uh, agree for another talk a little bit detailed one along with accelerator physics uh, one of the few days because this program is going to run for almost two months more thank you so much and uh, the students are also thanking you so much it was a really wonderful talk and i must tell you attendees at any time when, even when you are at msc or when you have finished msc and you have to do anything with accelerator nuclear atomic physics or particle physics this will be the talk that you should refer again and again from the youtube thank you so much thank you dr thank Singer. you Thank you Dr Verma for uh, inviting me. Thank it's, you very it's much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure Dr Singer. Dr Neetu okay. and Dr Parul I request you to stop the recording. Yes ma'am, we stop now. So okay, stay safe, enjoy physics. Thank you. Sure. Oh.